Chapter One. Let's go shopping. Of all the miserable holidays, these just about beat the lot," said Pip to Bets. "Why you had to start us off on this awful flu, I can't imagine." Bets looked hurt. "Well, I couldn't help it," she said. "Someone gave it to me before I gave it to you others. It was really bad luck that it happened at Christmas." Pip blew his nose violently. He was sitting up in bed, feeling decidedly better, but very bad-tempered. You get it as soon as the Christmas holes begin, and you get it lighter than anyone. Then you give it to Daisy, and she gives it to Larry, and they have it all through Christmas, poor things. And then I get it, and poor old Fatty. What a mess up of the Christmas holes! Hardly any left of them now. Pip sounded very cross indeed. Bets got up. All right. If you're going to be such a cross patch, I won't sit with you this morning. I'll go and see Fatty. I think you're very unkind, Pip. After all the games I've played with you and the books I've read you. She was just stalking out with her head in the air, looking very high and mighty, when Pip called to her. Hey, Bets, tell Fatty I'm feeling better and ask him to get on the track of some mystery at once, because I feel it's just the kind of tonic I need. And we've only got about ten days of the holes left. Bets grinned round at him. All right, I'll tell him. But Fatty can't just spin a mystery out of thin air, Pip. I think we'll have to go without one this holes. Fatty can do anything," said Pip with the utmost conviction. "I've been lying here for days, and most of the time I've been remembering all the mysteries we've ever solved with old Fatty. I've never had time to do so much thinking before. Old Fatty's a wonder. I knew that without having to do a lot of thinking," said Bets. "All his disguises and the way he works out the clues." And the tricks he's played on Mr. Goon. Oh yes," said Pip, a broad smile on his pale face. "It makes me feel better even to think of all those fat-headed tricks of Fatty's. For goodness' sake, tell Fatty to work on some mystery or other for us. It'll do us all good. Give us some interest in life." "I'm going," said Bets. "I'll bring a mystery back for you if I can. Bring some peppermints too," said Pip. "I've suddenly got a craving for them." No, bring a bag full of bullseyes, the hottest you can buy. I could do with about fifty bets to go with this detective book Fatty lent me. You must be feeling better," said Bets. She went out of the room and put on her outdoor things. She took some money out of her money box. She meant to buy Fatty something too. Bets had been a very faithful visitor and friend to the rest of the find outers while they had had the flu and had spent nearly all her Christmas money on them. She hadn't been able to help feeling guilty about giving everyone the flu, and she had tried to make up for it by playing games with the invalids, reading to them, and taking them anything she thought they would like. Fatty had been very touched by the little girl's kindness. He thought the world of Bets. Bets looked out of the garden door. Should she take her bicycle or not? It was so much quicker on a bike. She decided against it. The roads were slippery that frosty January day. She walked down to the village and spent a good deal of money on enormous bullseye peppermints, half for Pip and half for Fatty. If Pip had got to the convalescent stage of craving for sweets, then presumably Fatty would soon reach it too. She came out of the shop in time to see Mister Goon, the village policeman, sail slowly down the road on his bicycle, his nose purple with the cold air of the morning. He saw Bats and put on his brakes too quickly. His bicycle immediately skidded on the slippery surface, and Mister Goon found himself sitting down very suddenly in the middle of the road. "Gah," he said, glaring at Bets as if it was her fault. "Oh, Mister Goon, are you hurt?" cried Bets. "You sat down with such a bump." Mister Goon had plenty to sit down on, so he wasn't hurt, only considerably shaken. He got up and brushed down his trousers. These here slippery mornings will be the death of me," he said, looking at Bets as if she were responsible for the slipperiness. "I just put my brakes on, see, and down I came. That's all I get for wanting to be polite and to ask after your friends. I did hear they were all down with this here flu." "Yes, but they're getting better," said Bets. Mister Goon muttered something that sounded like, "What a pity!" He straddled his bicycle again. "Well." 
I must say, it's been a real change for me not having that nosy Parker of a boy sticking his nose into my business all the time he's home for the holidays, said Mr. Goon. It's a funny thing how that boy sniffs out anything that's going and gets you all into it. A good thing he's had to lie up in bed where he's out of mischief. You'll be back at school again in no time, and for once, you won't have made nuisances of yourselves. You'll get the flu yourself if you talk like that, said Betts. Stung into boldness, she was usually very scared of the policeman, especially if she met him when she was alone. Anyway, there's still time for something to crop up, and if it does, we'll be on the job long before you are, Mister Goon. And feeling rather victorious after this unexpected meeting and exchange of talk, Bats marched off with her head in the air. If you're seeing that big boy, tell him it's nice to know he's been kept out of mischief for once in a way. Mr. Goon shouted after her, "I've been having a nice peaceful time. I have without you five round my feet all the time to say nothing of that little pest of a dog." Bets pretended not to hear. Mr. Goon pedalled off, well satisfied. He guessed Bets would repeat everything, and he knew Fatty would be mad with him. But before he could make himself a nuisance, he'd be back at school again. Toad of a boy. Bets went to Fatty's house, let herself in at the garden door, and found Mrs. Trotville, Fatty's mother. Mrs. Trotville was fond of the little girl and smiled at her. Well, Bets, come to see Frederick again. You really are a faithful friend. I think he must be feeling distinctly better today. I've heard the most peculiar noises coming from his room whenever I go up on the landing. Oh, you don't think he's been sick again, do you? Said Bets in alarm. What sort of noises? Oh, voices and sounds," said Mrs. Trotville, "as if he's rehearsing for a play or something. You know what Frederick is like; always up to something." Bets nodded. She thought probably Fatty was practicing various voices for his different disguises: an old man's voice, a quavering old woman's, a deep manly voice. Fatty could imitate them all to perfection. "I'll take you up to his room," said Mrs. Trotville. He's expecting you. They went upstairs. Mrs. Trotville gave a sharp knock at Fatty's door. "Who is it?" said Fatty's voice. "I've got a visitor, Mummy." Mrs. Trotville looked astonished. As far as she knew, no other visitor had arrived that morning. It must have been someone the cook had ushered upstairs. She turned the handle, and she and Bets went into the room. Fatty appeared to be sunk deeply into his pillows, half asleep. Bets could see his dark, rumpled hair, but that was about all. Her heart sank. Yesterday, Fatty had been sitting up, looking quite sprightly. He couldn't be feeling so well if he felt more like lying down. She looked at his visitor. It was a bespectacled woman with an ugly pudding-shaped black hat pulled over her forehead. A bright green scarf was wound round her neck. Hiding part of her chin. Who on earth was she? Mrs. Trotville was at a loss too. Who was this strange visitor? She advanced towards her uncertainly. Oh, Mrs. Trotville," said the visitor in a mincing kind of voice. "You don't remember me, do you? We met at Bollingham two years ago. Such a nice place, isn't it?" "Oh,、uh, no, I don't think I do remember you." Said Mrs. Trotville, astonished. How did you know Frederick was ill, and who brought you up to his room? Really,、uh, it, it's kind of you, but oh, your nice cook brought me up," chattered the visitor, mopping her face with a large white handkerchief drenched with some strong scent. She said you were busy, so she just brought me up herself. Frederick was so pleased to see me, and who is this nice little girl? Betts was puzzled. She didn't understand this curious visitor, and why didn't Fatty sit up? Why hadn't he spoken to Betts? She looked at the mound his body made under the clothes. He must be asleep. She poked him hard. Fatty, wake up! You were awake a minute ago because you spoke to us when we knocked at the door. Sit up and speak to me. Fatty took no notice. He just lay there like a log. Mrs. Trotville began to feel alarmed. She too went to the bed and touched Fatty. Frederick, are you all right? Sit up. 
Bats glanced at the visitor, who had now got up and was looking out of the window, her back to them. Her shoulders were shaking slightly. What was the matter? It was very peculiar and mysterious, and Bats didn't like it at all. Mrs. Trotville turned back the covers of the bed. There was no fatty there. A dark wig had been put over a pudding basin, and bolsters had been laid in the bed. Mrs. Trotville gave a little scream. Fatty! Where's Fatty? But Bats knew where he was, of course. Chapter Two Fatty's Two Visitors Bats swung round to face the woman standing at the window. She ran to her and grabbed her arm. She shook it hard. Fatty! Fatty, you terror! You're your own visitor! Oh, Fatty! The visitor collapsed into a chair. Loud explosions came from her. Yes, it was certainly Fatty, all right. There was no mistaking that explosive laughter. Frederick! said his mother, amazed and annoyed. Are you out of your mind? You're supposed to be in bed. What in the world are you thinking of getting up and dressing in this ridiculous way? No, it's not funny. I'm vexed. I shall tell the doctor when he comes. Get those clothes off and get back into bed at once. Oh, Mummy, give me a minute to laugh, gasped Fatty, still collapsed in the chair. It was too comic to see you and Bets poking at me to make me speak and wondering who the visitor was and trying to be polite to her. And Fatty went off into great laughs again. Well, all I can say is that you must be feeling a lot better if you can get up to such silly antics, said Mrs. Trotville, still annoyed. I suppose such abnormal behaviour must mean that your temperature is normal again. Frederick, get back into bed at once. No, not with those awful clothes on. Where did you get them from? Cookie brought them for me from an old aunt of hers, said Fatty, pulling off the bright green scarf and the awful old hat. They're part of my wardrobe of disguises, Mummy. Don't pretend you don't know. Mrs. Trotville often had to turn a blind eye on many of Fatty's doings. There was simply no knowing what he would get up to next. She stared at the clothes in disgust. That awful scent, Frederick. I really can't even call it perfume. I shall have to open the window and let out the smell. Yes, do, said Fatty. I can't bear much more of it myself. Gosh, I did enjoy that. Here, Bets, hang up this long black coat and skirt in my big wardrobe over there. He stripped off the coat and skirt and appeared in his striped p a j a m a s Bets took the coat and skirt and was about to hang them up when Mrs. Trotville took them away from her. I really must tell Cook not to unload her aunt's old clothes onto him, she said. Mummy, don't you dare say a word, said Fatty in alarm. Cook's a marvel. She lets me have her uncle's old things too. I've got to get proper disguises from somewhere. You know perfectly well I'm going to be a first class detective as soon as I'm old enough, and you have to begin practising young. Don't you say a word to Cook. Frederick, I am not going to have the house full of old garments belonging to Cook's uncle and aunt, said his mother firmly. You needn't, Fatty almost wailed. I usually keep them down in my shed at the bottom of the garden, don't I, Bets? I just wanted to play this visitor trick on Bets, Mummy, that's all. So I got Cook to fetch these things from the shed for me. Bets can take them down to the shed this very minute if you want her to. Fatty was now in bed. He looked beseechingly at Bets and his mother. Mrs. Trotville thought that he had suddenly gone rather pale. All this silly excitement. All right, Frederick, we won't say any more, she said. Bets can take the things down when she goes. Put them out on the landing for now, Bets. Frederick, lie down. I'm sure your temperature must be going up again. I certainly won't let you get up for a short while this afternoon, if so. Mummy, Can Bet stay and have lunch with me? said Fatty, changing the subject quickly. He fully intended to get up that afternoon. Say she can. None of the others are coming to see me today. They're still wobbly. I'd like Bet's company, and you know she's quiet. She'd be very good for me, wouldn't you, Bet's? Bet's beamed. To spend the day with Fatty would be marvellous. Pip was in the bad tempered stage and too difficult to get on with amiably at the moment. It would be fun to stay with Fatty. She gazed hopefully at Mrs. Trotville, 
her arms full of the old clothes. Mrs. Trotbill considered. Well, yes, I think if Betts would like to stay, she would probably keep you from doing any further ridiculous things, she said. Would you like to stay, Betts, dear? And promise me that you won't let Fatty leap out of bed or dress up or play the fool in any way at all. I promise, said Betts happily. Thank you, Mrs. Trotville. I'll telephone your mother and see if it's all right, said Mrs. Trotville, and disappeared out of the room. Betts beamed again, and Fatty beamed back. Good old Betts, said Fatty, snuggling down in bed. Gosh, I nearly burst when you and Mummy kept poking at the bolster in the bed. It wasn't a very good disguise, really, but it was the best I could do on the spur of the moment. I feel better today, and I was longing for a joke of some kind. I guessed you'd be coming, so I got Cookie to fetch me those things from the shed. She's a pet, is Cookie. You must have been annoyed when your mother came in, too, said Betts. Oh, Fatty, it's nice that you're better. Have a peppermint? They're the biggest bullseyes I could buy. There's half for you and half for Pip. I must be a lot better, said Fatty, taking two peppermints and putting them both in his mouth at once. I couldn't possibly have even sniffed at a bullseye yesterday. I shouldn't be a bit surprised if I eat a lot of dinner today. You look awfully pale, Fatty, said Betts. Lie down for a bit. You really shouldn't have got out of bed and dressed up like that. Now don't you start lecturing, said Fatty. My legs do feel a bit funny, actually, but it was worth it. Now, spill the news. Have you got any? Betts faithfully gave her news. Fatty lay quiet and listened. He was feeling rather faint, but he wasn't going to tell Betts that. He hadn't realized that the effort of getting up and dressing and playing the fool would make him feel so weak. Apparently, you couldn't play about with flu too much, even if you were feeling better. Larry and Daisy are much better. Said Betts. They're both up and about now, though they haven't been out yet. Daisy says they'll be out tomorrow if it's sunny. They're extremely bored, though, and keep wishing something would happen. How's Pip? asked Fatty. Oh, he's better, except in his temper, said Betts. Don't you go and get bad tempered too, Fatty, when you're almost better. Oh, and I nearly forgot to tell you, I met Mr. Goon this morning. Ah, the great Mr. Goon, said Fatty. Half sitting up at the mention of his old enemy's name, and what had he to say? Well, he said "ga" at me, fell off his bicycle, and sat down hard in the road," <laughs> said Betts with a giggle. "Couldn't be better," said Fatty hard-heartedly. "And what else had he got to say beside 'ga'?" Betts told him. He said he'd had a nice, peaceful time without that nosy Parker of a boy interfering all the time," she said. He was really rather rude. He said it was a good thing you were in bed and out of mischief, and you'd be back at school again before you'd time to do any. Ha," said Fatty, sitting up straight now and looking very determined. "That's what he thinks, does he? Well, I'll be up properly tomorrow and out the next day. And Mister Goon had better be on his guard. Things will happen as soon as I'm up. What things?" asked Betts, thrilled. "A mystery, do you mean? Oh, Fatty!" Yes, a mystery. Even if I have to make one up myself," said Fatty. "If Mister Goon thinks he's ever going to have a nice, peaceful holiday when we're home, he's wrong. Bets we'll have some fun when I'm up. Gosh, it makes me feel better again already to think of it. What sort of fun?" asked Bets, her eyes shining. "Oh, Fatty, I wish a real mystery would turn up again, but there isn't time now. We'll all be back at school before we could solve it." If one did turn up, never mind. We'll have some fun with old Mister Goon first," said Fatty. "I'll plan it. We'll all be in it. I'll think of something. Don't you worry." Betts knew he would. There was absolutely no one like Fatty for thinking up things. He slithered down into bed again and shut his eyes. "Are you feeling all right?" asked Betts anxiously. "Gosh, yes. I just got an idea. That's all." Said Fatty, "You know how ideas come, all in a flash from your imagination. You don't even have to think of them. They don't come to me like that," said Betts. "I have to think hard before I dig up an idea, and even then, it's hardly ever a good one. You're a genius, Fatty." "Well," said Fatty modestly, 
I wouldn't quite say that, you know. But I can run rings round most people, can't I? <laughs> I mean, look how we've solved all those mysteries when I've been on the job, and... Fatty spent the next ten minutes unashamedly boasting, and Betts listened, unashamedly worshipping the boaster. In fact, they both had a very nice time. What's the time? said Fatty suddenly. Surely it must be dinner time, Betts. Have you got any more bull's eyes for me? I'm starving. I think I can hear dinner coming now, said Betts. Yes, it's your mother. I'll go and help her with the trays. Mrs. Trotville appeared, bearing a tray with two steaming platefuls of soup. Fatty eyed them in disappointment. Oh, Mummy! Soup again? When am I going to have a really decent meal? I'll never get better on soup. You said yesterday that you couldn't possibly take even a spoonful of soup, said his mother, putting the tray down. Don't worry. There's roast chicken and all the et ceteras if you want some. That's better, said Fatty. What's the pudding? Save me two helpings, Mummy. Mrs. Trotville laughed. Oh, Frederick, you do go to extremes. All right, the doctor says you can eat well now that your temperature is down. Betts, bring the tray down when you want the next course, and don't let Frederick gobble up your soup as well as his. Chapter 3 That Afternoon the two ate their soup in a pleasant silence. It was hot and well-flavoured. Fatty took two pieces of toast with it and crunched them up with appetite. He seemed to be hungrier even than Bet's. A distant bark came to their ears. Fatty listened and frowned. I do think Mummy might have let me have Buster in today, he said. He'd be good for me. You didn't want him in yesterday, said Bet's, spooning up the last of her soup. You said his bark would drive you mad. Did I really? said Fatty in surprise. Fancy me thinking old Buster's bark would ever drive me mad. I think he's got a very nice bark. Not too yappy and not too woofy. A proper Scotty bark. I wish you'd ask Mummy if I could have him in here this afternoon, Betts. She might do it if you asked her. All right, I'll ask her, said Betts, getting up to take the tray. But I bet she won't let him get on the bed, Fatty. Do you really want some chicken now? I feel a bit full up already. Yes, and plenty of bread sauce, said Fatty. And some more toast. That soup's made me feel warm and comfortable, but it hasn't done much else. Sure you don't want me to carry the tray for you, Betts? I'm fine, said Betts happily, and walked out with the tray. Mrs. Trotville was surprised to hear that Fatty really wanted chicken. She filled a plate for him, and one for Betts. The pudding is stewed apple and rice pudding, she said. He said he wanted two helpings, but I'm sure he won't want even one. There, can you manage, Betts? Betts arrived in the bedroom with the tray and put it down by Fatty's bed. He eyed it with satisfaction. I'd better get on to that before my appetite fades away, he said, and began to tuck in. Yes, certainly Fatty was on the mend. Nobody could eat like that if they were feeling at all ill. He slowed down a bit before he reached the end of the chicken and vegetables. "'What's the pudding?' he asked Betts. "'Stewed apple and rice,' said Betts. Fatty made a face. "'What a pudding to plan for someone in bed! It's bad enough to be faced with that when you're up and about. I won't have any.' "'I suppose you're pretending you would have had two enormous helpings if it had been treacle pudding,' suggested Betts slyly. "'You're a fibber, Fatty.' You can't eat another thing. Nor can I, as a matter of fact. <laughs> I'll take this tray down now. Don't forget to ask Mummy if Buster can come up this afternoon, Fatty called to her. Betts delivered the tray, broke the news about the lack of appetite for apples and rice, and asked about Buster. Well, said Mrs. Trotville, considering the matter. Well... I wouldn't mind if I thought Frederick would keep quiet and not get excited with Buster tearing all over the place. Oh, and Betts, your mother said you could stay on to tea if you liked. She says Pip has got someone coming to see him this afternoon, and it would be good for you to have a change and be with Frederick for a bit. Would you like to? Oh, yes, said Betts. But doesn't Fatty rest a bit in the afternoon? I mean, I had to sleep after my dinner when I had flu. Yes, certainly he must said Mrs. Trotville. 
But you needn't stay with him then. You can come down here and have a book to read, and then go back again when he is awake. He can bang on the floor when he has had enough sleep, and if he still wants Buster, you can take him up then. Oh, good," said Bet. "I'll just go out into the kitchen and have a word with old Buster, Mrs. Trotville. He must be missing us all so." Buster gave her a frantic welcome. He tore round her on his short legs, rolled over, bounced up again, and altogether behaved as if he was about six months old. He barked non-stop, and the two maids sitting with their cups of tea put their hands up to their ears. "He's going upstairs to Fatty this afternoon," said Bets. "Did you hear that, Buster? Going to Fatty?" Buster thought that Bets meant he was going that very minute. He flung himself at the closed door and barked madly. Bets laughed. "I'll come and fetch you later on," she said. "In about an hour or so, Buster." She managed to slide out of the door before Buster could squeeze out too. She left him barking crossly. What? She had gone to see his beloved master and not taken him after all her promises. <laughs> Bets went back upstairs to tell Fatty the good news. I'll settle you down if you like, she said to him. Then you can go to sleep, and when you wake up, bang on the floor with this stick, and I'll come up with Buster. I'm allowed to stay to tea, so we've plenty of time to talk and play games. Good," said Fatty, pleased. He was now feeling sleepy, and he snuggled down. But don't go, Bets. There's a nice, comfy chair over there. Look, and you can borrow one of my Sherlock Holmes stories if you like. There's a pile on that table. Your mother said I was to go downstairs and read," said Bets. "I'd better go." No, don't," said Fatty. I don't like being left alone. Stay with me, Bets. Don't be silly. You don't care at all about being alone, and you'll be asleep in a few moments," said Bets with a laugh. Bets," said Fatty suddenly, in a voice that made her look across at him in surprise. Bets, you must stay with me, because of the voices. Bets gaped at him. Voices? Whatever did Fatty mean? What voices? She said. I don't know," said Fatty, still very mysterious. Sometimes, it's a duck, I think, and other times it's a hen, and once it was a dog whining. Bets was amazed. "What? Here in your bedroom?" she asked disbelievingly. "Fatty, you must have had a very high temperature to think you heard voices. I tell you, there are voices in this bedroom when I'm all alone." Said Fatty, leaning up on one elbow. He looked very earnest. There's a silly old man too who keeps asking for a cigarette. Bets, do stay with me. If you hear the voices, we could try and find out what they are. Do stay here and sit in that chair. But don't you say a word to Mummy, will you? She'll think I've got a temperature or something again. All right, I'll stay," said Bets, puzzled and disbelieving. But I believe you're making it all up, Fatty, just to make me stay here with you. You shouldn't do that, Bets. As sure as I lie here, there have been voices in my room," said Fatty. "Will you believe me if you hear them? See that duck on the mantelpiece, the china one. Well, I've heard it quacking. And see that dog in the picture. He barks and whines. You lie down, Fatty," said Bets, and she pushed him down. "You're dreaming or just being silly." I'm going to sit in that chair and read Sherlock Holmes. Don't say another word, or we'll have your mother up here. Fatty lay down. Bet sat in the chair, wondering why Fatty spoke so much about voices. She decided that he must have had such a high temperature that he had wandered a little in his mind and heard voices that were not really there. She opened her book and yawned. Bet fell asleep, and so did Fatty. Except for a log falling in the grate, where a bright fire was burning, there was nothing to be heard. Buster was snoozing in the kitchen, keeping one eye open for the big cat. The cat had to keep a certain distance. One paw over the line, and Buster flew at her. The clock on the mantelpiece ticked on. Half past two, three o'clock. It was raining outside, and the afternoon was dark. It would have been too dark for Bets to read if she had been awake. Half past three, both Fatty and Bets were perfectly still, and the fire grew rather low. 
Then Bets woke up with a jump. She sat up, wondering where she was. Of course, she was in the big chair in Fatty's bedroom. How low the fire was! Fatty must still be asleep because he hadn't put on his light, and the room was really very dark. <coughs> Bets almost jumped out of her skin. She gazed incredulously at the big china duck on the mantelpiece. Did the quacking come from there? Her heart began to beat fast. Was this one of Fatty's voices? She stared at the duck and thought she saw it move. <coughs> there it was again, a rather deep quack, just like the noise made by the drakes on the pond. Bets couldn't believe her eyes. <coughs> Bets was glued to her chair. That was a hen clucking now, a hen in the bedroom. But how? Why? And now there was a dog whining softly. She glanced at the picture of the dog, but could hardly see it in the darkness. It whined again and gave a little yap. And then, a quavery old voice came from the wardrobe in the far corner. A cigarette, please, sir. Just a cigarette. Oh dear. Said Bets in fright, "Fatty, Fatty, wake up! Your voices are here." There was a click as Fatty suddenly switched on his bedside light. He sat up in bed, looking at Bets. "Did you hear them too?" he said. "Listen, the old man is beginning again." He pointed over to the wardrobe. Bets looked across at once. "A cigarette, please, sir. Just a cigarette." "I don't like it." Said Bets, and she rushed over to Fatty. I'm frightened, Fatty. What is it? <coughs> oh, Fatty, Fatty, what is it? Wept Bets and covered her face and ears. Fatty, come out of this room. I'm frightened. Oh, Bets, don't cry. I didn't mean to make you cry," said Fatty, and put an arm round the scared little girl. I thought you'd guess what it was at once. You are a little silly, Bets, not to guess. Guess what? Asked Bets, astonished. She looked up into Fatty's smiling face. Fatty, it's not just a trick you're doing, is it? What is it? It's a bit of a secret, Bets," said Fatty, putting his mouth to her ear. I'm practicing to be a ventriloquist. That's all. Didn't you really guess? Chapter Four, A Lesson on Ventriloquism. Bets could hardly believe her ears. She stared at Fatty's grinning face in amazement. But, but, was it you then making that duck on the mantelpiece quack? She said, and that hen cluck, and the dog bark, and that old man ask for a cigarette. It can't be you, Fatty. It is though, said Fatty. I've been working at it all last term. Gosh, the noises that have come from the corners of our dorm each night, and the noises in class too. Once I even got the master to open a cupboard to see if a cat was mewing there. But Fatty, how do you do it? Asked Bets, staring at him. I've seen ventriloquists on the stage, of course, making their dolls speak. But how do you do it, Fatty? I didn't like it. Now don't you be silly," said Fatty. I wouldn't have played the trick on you if I thought you were going to be scared. It just shows I must be really good. There's no talking duck or hen or dog or old man in this room, Bets. You must know that. I wanted to try and see if I could puzzle you. I didn't mean to frighten you. Gosh, I must be a better ventriloquist than I thought. A voice came from the wardrobe again, or at least Bets thought it did. A cigarette, please, sir. Just a cigarette. Bets looked swiftly round at Fatty, and this time she laughed. "Oh, Fatty, you're clever, but I just saw your throat moving when you said that. How do you manage to throw your voice somewhere else, though, Fatty? It's marvelous. Whatever will the others say?" Fatty sat comfortably up in bed. "Well," he began, "I'll tell you a bit about it, Bets. A man came down to our school last term to entertain us." He was a ventriloquist, and he had a couple of idiotic-looking dolls whose heads could turn from side to side, their eyes could open and shut, and their mouths worked up and down. You've seen a ventriloquist, haven't you? Well, 
he was absolutely super, this man. I honestly couldn't see either his mouth or his throat working in even the smallest movement. And yet, it was his own voice that made those dolls seem to talk, and sing, too. Yes, I think ventriloquists are marvellous, too, said Betts. I haven't the faintest idea how they do it. But you must know, Fatty, because you can ven ventil... Ven ventril... Ventriloquize, said Fatty. Well, I do know a bit now, but I've had to get it out of books, because you can't learn interesting and really useful things like ventriloquism, or conjuring, or disguising yourself at school. Such a pity they don't have things like that in the timetable. Wouldn't I work at them? Yes, so would I, said Betts. Did you have to practice ventriloquism yourself then, Fatty, with nobody to help you? Yes, said Fatty. But it's difficult to be anywhere by yourself at school, you know, so I had to let a few of the boys into the secret. We've got about six ventriloquists at my school now. But you're the best, I bet you are, Fatty, said Betts at once. Fatty wished he could say he was, but honesty compelled him to admit that another boy was better than he was. We've got an African boy at our school, he said, a Zulu prince or something. He's the best. But that's not to be wondered at, because apparently all his uncles and great-uncles and grandfathers were able to throw their voices wherever they wanted to. Anyway, when he knew I was trying to learn to throw my voice, he showed me a few tricks. Tell me, Fatty, begged Betts. What tricks? Well, said Fatty, banging his pillows and settling himself comfortably. First of all, I'll explain the name ventriloquism. It comes from two words. Venter, which means tummy and loqui, which means to speak. In other words, a ventriloquist was supposed to be a man who could speak by using his tummy in some way. Do you use your tummy, then? asked Betts. As a matter of fact, the people who thought that made a mistake. The tummy is not used, said Fatty. Oh, what is, then? asked Betts, intensely interested. Well, said Fatty, as far as I can see, a ventriloquist forms his words in the ordinary way, but he lets his breath escape very slowly indeed, and he closes up his glottis, his throat, as much as he can, and opens his mouth as little as possible. Oh, and he only uses the tip of his tongue. Betts couldn't follow this, but she didn't much mind, as she had no intention of becoming a ventriloquist herself. She was quite sure she would be no good at it at all. The whole thing sounded quite impossible to do. But Fatty, as usual, had tackled the impossible and done it. You are clever, Fatty, she said. Now do some more ventriloquism and let me see how you do it. But she couldn't see, of course, except that Fatty's throat moved a little, and once his lips moved too. Just a cigarette, please, just a cigarette, came a quavering voice which didn't appear to be anywhere near Fatty at all. She instinctively looked over to the wardrobe again. Fatty was looking there, too, as if somebody was really there. "'It's strange,' said Betts. "'Really strange. How do you throw your voice like that, Fatty?' "'I don't, really. You just think I do, and you look at the place where you imagine the voice is coming from and hear it there,' said Fatty. "'That's just a trick, of course. Though this Zulu boy I was telling you about can really throw his voice, it seems to me. Anyway, one day it sounded to us as if there was somebody calling us from outside the classroom door, but when we went to see, there wasn't anyone in sight, and old Benjamin was sitting in his chair inside the room, grinning away like anything. I fooled the English boys, I fooled you, he kept saying. I wish I went to your school, said Betts. You always make it sound so exciting, Fatty. Fancy you being a ventriloquist now. Whatever will you be next? Well... You just never know when things like that will help you, said Fatty. It might come in very useful with my detective work when I'm grown up. It's a really amusing trick, anyhow. There came the sound of excited barking and the thump of leaping feet on the stairs. Buster, said Fatty. Gosh, in all this excitement about my ventriloquist act, we'd forgotten about poor old Buster. Bets, don't say a word to Mother about my ventriloquist stunt. Before Betts could assure Fatty that she certainly wouldn't, the door opened, and in came Mrs. Trotville with a tremendously excited Buster rushing in front. He leapt straight onto the bed, of course, and flung himself on Fatty. 
He put his paws up on the boy's shoulders and proceeded to lick him all over the face, barking loudly. Mercy, Buster, mercy! begged Fatty and disappeared completely under the bedclothes to escape the excited dog. Buster followed at once, and a curious heaving earthquake formed itself in the bed, accompanied by yells and barks. Frederick! Buster must come out! cried Mrs. Trotville. Oh dear! Neither of them can hear me! Fatty! Buster! Fatty! Fatty appeared eventually, his hair tousled, his eyes bright, holding Buster in such a tight grip that the dog couldn't move even a leg. What do you do with mad dogs, Mummy? he asked. Honestly, he's quite dippy. Oh, Frederick, put him down outside the bed, said Mrs. Trotville. That's right, Buster. If you dare to get on the bed again, I'll set the cat on you. Woof! barked Buster rudely. Woof to that! Frederick, listen, said his mother. It's almost tea time. You can get up, put on your dressing gown, and stay up for two hours. You can have tea while you're up. Bets can go and get it in ten minutes' time. She went out of the room, and Buster immediately leapt up onto the bed again. But this time he was not so uproarious. He had given Fatty the welcome he had been saving up for him. Now he was content to lie by him, licking his hand whenever it came near his black nose. Bets got Fatty's dressing gown and slippers and put the armchair in front of the fire. Fatty got out of bed. At first he meant to leap out. But somehow his legs failed to obey his orders. He found that his knees were still very shaky. Are you going to tell the others about your ventriloquism? asked Betts. Will you teach them too? No, I won't teach them, said Fatty. The difficulty is not so much the learning, Betts, it's the practicing. You make all kinds of strange noises then, and people don't like it. No, I can't see Mummy being very pleased if Pip tried to learn, said Betts. She says he's noisy enough already. Anyway, his school report wasn't very good. She and Daddy would be sure to think it was messing about with ventriloquism that made him not work hard at his class subjects. Pity, said Fatty, beginning on the buttered toast. Is there any honey to go with the toast? I always think hot buttery toast and honey make a good pair, but usually you get one without the other. No, there's no honey. Be a pet and go and ask for some bets. Don't be too long, or else the honey won't be needed. Why not? said Bets, surprised. Because there won't be any toast left to go with it, said Fatty. Go on, hurry. Don't dare to eat it all. I never in my life saw such lovely, drippy toast. It's just so buttery, said Bets. She went out to get the honey. Fatty looked down at Buster, who was sitting beside him, looking up adoringly. His mouth open and his tongue hanging out because of the heat of the fire. Fatty tipped up a piece of buttery toast and let two or three drops of the melted butter drip down to Buster's pink tongue. Buster was agreeably surprised. He swallowed twice and then held out his tongue again. <coughs> said Fatty down in his throat. Buster looked at him inquiringly and wagged his tail. <coughs> clucked Fatty. Where's that hen, Buster? Where is it? Buster thumped his tail on the ground, but he didn't go and look for either duck or hen. Too sensible, aren't you? said Fatty with his mouth full. No matter where I pretend the sounds come from, you know they're made by me, don't you? <laughs> quack, 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 quack. Chapter 5 Buster and the Goon Hears Strange Voices in three days' time, all the find outers were apparently completely themselves again. Perhaps a spurt of brilliantly fine weather had something to do with it. All of them felt that they must be out in the sunshine, however cold it was otherwise. They went for their first walk together that holiday, enjoying the stroll, though only Bets really felt like running. I vote we pop into the cafe and have a hot cup of chocolate, said Fatty as they turned onto the high street. Come on, Buster. It's no use staring at cats that are safely sitting on walls. They won't come down for you to chase them. Funny that a clever dog like you shouldn't have learned that elementary fact yet. They went into the little cafe and sat down at one of the tables there. In the summer, they had ice-cold milk there and ice creams or lemonade. In the winter, 
the little shop did a roaring trade in hot milk, cocoa, and hot chocolate. A short woman came to serve them. Well, well, she said, beaming at them. I thought you must have gone back to school. I've not seen you for so long. What would you like? Hot chocolate, ginger biscuits, and currant buns, please, said Fatty. He drew a handful of change out of his pocket to pay. Fatty always had plenty of money. I'll pay, said Larry. I've not spent half my Christmas money yet. You're always paying for us. Fatty let him pay. He knew that it often made Larry feel embarrassed when he so often had to allow him, Fatty, to pay for their treats. Anyway, Fatty could always pay for the second round of chocolate and biscuits. Flu seems to have enlarged my appetite, he said. I've not stopped feeling hungry for two days. How nice, said Daisy. I like feeling hungry. Only because you know you're going to get plenty to eat, said Pip. It wouldn't be any fun being hungry if you thought there wasn't going to be even a bit of bread to chew for days. Nobody could think of an answer to that remark. Buster suddenly got up and went to the door. He barked loudly. Be quiet, said Fatty. Behave yourself, Buster. Don't bark at that dear old lady. He's not, said Bet suddenly, peering through the shop window from where she sat. It's Mr. Goon. Well, I hope he keeps out of here, said Pip. Beginning on a current bun. Oh, these are great! New as anything! Bats let her eyes wander round the shop. Up on the mantelpiece was a model of a cow standing about two feet high. It had a head that would nod up and down if anyone set it going. She got up and went over to it. I like this cow, she said. I'll set its head nid nodding. Let's see if it manages to nod it the whole time we're here. She set the head nodding. And went back to her chair, watching the cow. Buster began to bark again, and the five swung their heads round to the door. Mr. Goon was standing there, the buttons on his tunic stretched to bursting point. Call this dog to you, he commanded Fatty. Put him on a lead. I want to have him dancing round my ankles. Why? Are you coming to have a drink of hot milk or something? asked Fatty. He deftly put Buster on the lead and made him sit down. Fatty was hoping against hope that Mr. Goon was indeed coming to sit in the shop and have a drink. Fatty had a bright idea and wanted to carry it out. Mr. Goon stalked in and sat down at the table next but one to the five children's. He called for a cup of cocoa and a bun. Cold outside for you again, isn't it, Mr. Goon? said the short woman, setting down a cup of cocoa and a bun in front of the red faced policeman. Mr. Goon took no notice of her. He glanced across at the children. Huh. Seems like I've had a nice, quiet time these holidays, he began. No nosy parkering, no interfering with the law. That says something for the flu, that does. You must have felt funny not being able to stick your noses in a mystery. Nobody answered. Fatty spoke a few words to Larry, and Larry said a few back. Nobody looked at Mr. Goon. He didn't like being ignored. He raised his voice. Or have you got a mystery on hand? He began again. A nice, juicy mystery to make a mess of. Fatty looked at him. Now, how did you hear that, Mr. Goon? He said in a surprised voice. Larry, have you been saying anything about our latest mystery? Larry rose immediately to Fatty's invitation to be absurd. Which case do you mean? He said. The mystery of the red nosed reindeer, or the one about the flying saucers? We've solved them both, haven't we? Oh, yes. I didn't mean those, said Fatty. Mr. Goon probably knows all about those by now. They're stale news, aren't they, Mr. Goon? No, Larry. I meant the mystery of the strange voices. Gah! said Mr. Goon, biting violently into his bun. Strange voices? You don't know what you're talking about. Lot of silly make believe. The other four had pricked up their ears when they heard Fatty refer to strange voices. They all knew about his ventriloquial powers now, and he had practised a few of his tricks in front of them. Why had he mentioned strange voices to Mr. Goon? Lot of silly make believe, said Mr. Goon again, and took a sip of hot cocoa. Strange voices? Gah! Oh, yes, that mystery's not solved yet, is it? said Larry. Speaking to Fatty in a voice loud enough for Mr. Goon to hear. 
Curious case, that. People hearing strange voices which aren't really there. Somebody casting a spell on them, I suppose. Baby talk, said Mr. Goon, drinking his cocoa rather loudly. You may be right, said Fatty seriously. But believe it or not, some people lately have been hearing ducks quack where there are no ducks, hens clucking, and people speaking, and yet there don't seem to be any there. You'll tell me that cow on the mantelpiece will start to moo next, said Mr. Goon, swallowing the last of his current bun. Fatty scribbled something quickly on a piece of paper and pushed it across the table to the others. Cow will moo, he had written, but none of you is to hear it. Mr. Goon wiped his mouth. Quacking ducks, clucking hens, mooing cows, he observed sarcastically. Silly make believe. Bosh and rubbish. It's a nice cow, isn't it? said Betts, looking across at it. Its head is still going up and down. Mr. Goon looked across at it, too. Mmm, 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 said the cow, mooing in exact time to the nodding of its head. The mooing was so realistic and so exactly in time with the nodding that even the children, with the exception of Fatty, thought for one moment that the mooing noise did actually come from it. Mr. Goon stared at the cow, astounded. He glanced round at the children. Not one of them, of course, took any notice of the mooing, remembering Fatty's hastily scribbled instructions. They lifted up their cups and drank, Bets hoping to goodness that she wouldn't start to giggle. Mr. Goon looked at the nodding cow again. It had stopped mooing, principally because Fatty had been overcome with an urge to laugh. But as Goon looked at it, it gave such a large and unexpected moo that the policeman jumped violently. Then the mooing quietened and went on in time with the nodding of the animal's head. Mr. Goon swallowed hard. Moo! 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 went the cow, nodding its head. Nobody would ever have believed that it was merely Fatty throwing the noise across to the mantelpiece. Mr. Goon felt rather sick. He didn't know what to make of it at all. He looked at the children again. They were taking absolutely no notice at all of the mooing cow. Neither was Buster, of course. Was it possible that they were not hearing what Mr. Goon was hearing? The little woman came bustling into the shop with some more buns for the children. The cow stopped mooing. Mr. Goon cleared his throat and spoke to the shopwoman. Er,、uh, nice cow that of yours, my good woman. The one on the mantelpiece, I mean. Very lifelike. You'd almost expect it to moo. You will have your joke, sir, said the little woman. My, if I heard it moo, I'd think there was something wrong with me. I'd think I was going crazy. That's just what we were saying, said Fatty gravely. Strange voices are about. People are hearing them. What are they? A warning? Oh, I'm glad I don't hear them. Well, we live in funny times, no doubt about it, said the little shopwoman, puzzled, and hurried off again. The cow began to moo once more, but so softly that Mr. Goon was not absolutely sure if he was hearing it or not. Could he be imagining it? He gazed so earnestly at the nodding cow that Betts felt an irresistible giggle rising up from the very middle of her tummy. She knew from experience that they were the worst kind of giggles, the ones that heaved up and broke out helplessly. Talk! Do talk! she besought the others in a low voice. I'm going to laugh! All but Fatty talked in low voices, saying any nonsense that came into their heads. Fatty stopped making the cow moo. Mr. Goon sat back cautiously. Thank goodness the cow was behaving normally now. Maybe his ears had just played him a trick. Quack, quack, quack. Mr. Goon jumped violently again and looked all round. That was a duck quacking, no doubt about it. Quack. Mr. Goon's eyes caught sight of a wild duck, beautifully stuffed, placed in a glass case at the end of the shop. He gazed at it, holding his breath. Quack, quack, quack. The duck appeared to be looking at him out of its glass eye, and its half open beak seemed to be quacking. Mr. Goon leapt up, full of horror. That duck! he said wildly. Did you hear it? What duck? asked Larry. 
Oh, Mr. Goon, surely, surely you are not suggesting that the duck in the glass case is quacking, Mr. Goon? Don't say you are hearing the strange voices," said Fatty earnestly and solemnly. Quack! The noise seemed to come from somewhere behind Mr. Goon. He gave a loud, hunted cry and ran from the shop, Buster almost tripping him up with his lead. And then the children collapsed over the table, crying tears of laughter into their empty cups. Mr. Goon, Mr. Goon, you couldn't have been funnier. Chapter Six. Something happens at last. Oh, Fatty, how do you do it? Said Daisy, mopping her eyes and feeling very weak. The way you made that cow moo in time to its nodding was perfect. Honestly, I could have believed myself that the thing was mooing. So could I," said Bets. "Oh dear, <laughs> don't do that sort of thing too often, Fatty. I simply won't be able to keep my giggles down if you do." <laughs> Mister Goon's face, his eyes almost fell out of his head. He must be feeling pretty puzzled," said Larry. "I bet he'll wake up at night and hear noises that aren't there." They paid their second bill and went out. What a pity there wasn't any first-class mystery to probe into. These were the first holidays in which nothing of any sort or kind had turned up, and there were only a few days left. Can't we spoof old Mister Goon a bit just to have some kind of excitement in our last few days? Said Larry. That laugh did me more good than a dozen days in bed. Me too, said Pip. I was feeling rather low this morning, but now I'm feeling fine. That's obviously what we all need—a really good laugh every now and again. And Fatty's the one to give it to us," said Bets, squeezing his arm. "Fatty, do let's see if we can't spoof Mr. Goon a bit." "But how?" said Fatty. "I mean, we can't follow him around with all kinds of noises. He'd soon begin to associate them with us." If every time he hears a cow moo or a duck quack or hears mysterious voices going on and sees us somewhere near, well, even he's wide awake enough to put two and two together, us and the noises. I suppose you're right," said Bets with a sigh, putting away her visions of pursuing Mister Goon with strange and wonderful sounds. Well, perhaps something will happen to give us a bit of excitement. It was strange that she said that. Because that very night something did happen, though nothing very startling. They didn't know about it till the next morning. The milkman told Larry, "Heard about the break-in at the Cedars last night," he said. "It's next door but one from you. It's a small house, and a man called Mister Fellows has rented it since a week or two ago. Lived there all alone." "What happened?" said Larry. "Well, apparently somebody broke in and rifled the house from top to bottom." Said the milkman, "We don't know if Mister Fellows was there or not. Anyway, he's gone this morning. Hasn't come back yet either." "Who discovered this?" asked Larry, quite excited to think that all this had taken place so near to his own home. Why, he might have heard something in the night—a shout, the breaking of a window, or something. However, he had been too sound asleep. I found the house door open and a window broken at the back when I took the milk early this morning," said the milkman. "I peeped in at the hall door, and my, what a mess the place was in! I stepped in and telephoned the police at once. Oh, did Mister Goon come?" asked Larry, disappointed. He had hoped for one moment that the find outers might get in first. It was still early, only just after breakfast. Yes, he's there now. Taking notes and looking for fingerprints and the rest of it," said the milkman. "He's feeling important this morning. Told me to keep my big mouth shut and not tell anyone what I found. After I told every single one of my customers, <laughs> what does he think I am? A clam?" "Did you notice anything at all out of the ordinary?" asked Larry. "Nothing," said the milkman. "I didn't stop to look round. Anyway, I telephoned the police at once. Mustn't disturb anything, you know, in cases like this." Larry got on his bicycle and went to tell Fatty. It might be nothing, or it might be something interesting. You never knew. Fatty would soon get the old brains to work and decide if the find outers were to do anything or not. Fatty was most interested. This cheers me up immensely," he said. 
It may be a potty little robbery, but we'd better go and find out. If the house really was rifled from top to bottom, it looks as though someone was trying very hard to find something of great importance to him. What was it? And who was it? They collected Pip and Bats, fetched Daisy, and all five of them, with Buster, went up to the house that stood two doors from Larry's. It didn't look as if anyone was there. Mr. Goon must have come and gone. Good. Now then, said Fatty, examine all the paths and beds round the house. Look for usual things. Footmarks, cigarette ends, handprints on window ledges, etc. Make notes of what you find, and we'll compare later. Aren't you coming with us? asked Bets, seeing Fatty turn away. No, I'm going to look in the windows and see if there's anything interesting inside, said Fatty. But the curtains were drawn across, and he couldn't see anything. He went steadily round the little house, but not one window could he see into. The front door was closed and fastened now, and the back door was locked too. Fatty came to the broken window at the back. It was the kitchen window. Obviously, the robber, or whatever he was, had got in here. Fatty stuck his hand inside and moved the curtain. The kitchen was upside down. Drawers had been pulled from the dresser and from the table. Cupboards were open and their contents dragged out onto the floor. What could the intruder have been looking for? Fatty suddenly heard a sound inside the kitchen. He listened. What was it? He heard it again, and then peeping in at the window once more, he made out two gleaming eyes looking at him from a cupboard. Meow, meow, said the owner of the eyes piteously. Gosh, it's a kitten! Said Fatty, scared to death, I expect, and nobody to feed it or care for it, poor little thing. The others came round the corner of the house, notebooks in their hands. Here, said Fatty, beckoning. There's a kitten left in the house. What shall we do? Get it, said Daisy promptly. How? Asked Pip. All the doors and windows are shut tight. We've checked that. This one's broken, said Fatty. If I wrap my hand in a handkerchief, I think I could put it through the broken pane and do what the thief did: undo the clasp and open the window. Then I could get in and rescue the kitten. Well, go on then," said Larry, looking all round. "There's no one about. Mister Goon won't come back yet." Fatty took out a big white handkerchief. He twisted it firmly round his fingers. Then he gingerly put his hand through the hole in the broken pane and tried to reach the fastening of the window. It was a casement opening sideways once the clasp was moved. Got it," said Fatty, and jerked the clasp. It slid down stiffly, and he took back his hand again. He could now easily open the window. "Damn it," he said, pleased, and hopped up to the ledge. Buster began to bark, wanting to go with Fatty. "Keep him quiet, for goodness' sake," said Fatty. "We don't want anyone to see me climbing in." They hushed Buster while Fatty climbed nimbly into the kitchen. He found the tiny kitten, which crouched back in the cupboard, spitting and scared. But it soon began purring when Fatty picked it up and petted it. "I'll find some milk," he called quietly to the others. "I expect it's hungry." He came to the pantry and looked inside. Even that was untidy, and a broken dish lay on the tiled floor. Fancy hunting in the pantry too. Whatever had the intruder been after? Here you are, Kitty," said Fatty, and put down a saucer of milk for the little creature. It lapped hungrily. When it had finished, it rubbed itself against Fatty's legs, purring. He bent to pick it up, but it scurried away and ran through the doorway into the hall. "Puss, puss," called Fatty. "Come back here." "What's up?" said Pip's voice, looking in at the window. Daisy says if you hand the kitten out to her, she'll take it home, as she lives so near. They've got a kitten too, and it can be with hers till somebody comes back here. Right, but I'll have to find it first," said Fatty. "It's dashed through the kitchen door into the hall. Half a minute, I'll get it. I can hear it there somewhere." He went out of the kitchen door into the hall. He paused there, amazed at the untidiness. Coats, shoes, and umbrellas were all in wild confusion on the floor, flung there from the hall cupboard and from a chest of drawers. The kitten was nowhere to be seen. 
Fatty went into one room after another, but the little thing was hiding, whether from fright or from play, he didn't know. Fatty took the opportunity of having a good look round. There were three rooms downstairs, and three above, and a bathroom. Each of them was in confusion. By the soot that lay in the fireplaces, Fatty guessed that the hunter had even felt up the chimney for whatever it was that he had been looking for. And then, as he came out from a bedroom onto the little landing, Fatty saw something in a corner near the top of the stairs. It was bright red. He picked it up. A child's glove, he said to himself. A very small glove for a very small child. But surely there was no child here, and there's only one glove. Could Mr. Fellows have been hiding a child here, kidnapped it perhaps, and the other fellow came to find it? He shook his head. No, people don't look for even very small children up chimneys and in drawers. I wonder whether there are any more clothes for a child here. It doesn't look like a house where children came at all. Not a single toy, not a book or a doll, and no cot. There were no children's clothes to be seen, thrown in the muddle on the floor. All kinds of other clothes were there. Men's coats, trousers, vests, shoes, hats, as well as a trouser press flung down and opened. Books, cushions, papers, blankets, sheets, pillowcases. Well, said Fatty, slipping the child's red glove into his pocket. I'll keep it, just in case. Though in case of what, I don't know. Only one of the pair. That's the mysterious part. Was a child here last night, and was it dressed in a hurry so that it dropped one glove? No, it couldn't be. A loud whisper penetrated to him. Fatty, quick! Mr. Goon's coming back! He's coming up the road! Quick, Fatty! Chapter 7 Mr. Goon is Astounded Almost before Fatty had time to get downstairs, there came the sound of Goon's angry voice. Now then, you kids, what are you doing here? Clear off! Then came the sound of Buster's barking. Fatty grinned. How many, many times had this same scene been acted? The find-outers snooping round, Goon finding them, ordering them off, and Buster objecting loudly. Well... Buster could certainly look after not only himself, but all the children, too. Fatty wondered whether he could slip out of the front door. He could hear that Mr. Goon was round at the back. Interfering with the law, he heard in the policeman's angry voice. Poking your noses in. What's it to do with you, I'd like to know? Clear off! Well, we live just close by, said Larry. It's naturally interesting to us. To Daisy and me, I mean. If burglars are in the district, I want to get some information in case they come to rob our house, too, next door but one. Gah, said Goon disbelievingly. Tommy Rot, just an excuse for interfering. This here job's a potty little job. No mystery in it at all. Not worth your notice, see? And take that dog away before I lose my temper with him. Nasty, yappy little mongrel. Fatty longed to be out there with the others. Calling Buster a mongrel. Why, the little Scotty had a pedigree a yard long, and all his grandparents had been champions. Fatty boiled with rage. He tiptoed to the front door. He didn't want Mr. Goon to catch him in the house, even though he had the perfectly good excuse to offer about rescuing the kitten. Where's that big boy? demanded Mr. Goon, suddenly realising that Fatty was absent. Still in bed with the flu, I hope. Best place for him, too. Hope he gets a relapse. Will you call this dog off? Larry called Buster. Buster, come here. I can find some better ankles for you if you want some. Mr. Goon snorted. That was one of the things he did remarkably well. Get out of this garden, all of you, he said. Any more messing about here and I'll report you. Yes, and I'll go round to your parents again, too. Especially yours, Philip Hilton. Pip hastily removed himself from the garden of the little house, taking bets with him. He didn't want Goon to make any more complaints to his parents. They had a habit of taking Mr. Goon seriously. Larry and Daisy followed, Larry holding Buster by the collar. They stood outside the front gate, 
wondering what Fatty was going to do. Fatty was most unfortunate. He opened the front door from inside at exactly the same moment that Mr. Goon unlocked it from the outside. Mr. Goon stared at Fatty as if a thunderbolt had hit him. His mouth fell open and he went a familiar purple colour. He swallowed hard. Good morning, Mr. Goon, said Fatty smoothly. Do come in. I'll shut the door for you. Mr. Goon stepped in, still wordless. Then he exploded into speech. What are you doing here? Here, in this house that's under police supervision. You want to get locked up, I suppose, being found on enclosed premises and up to no good, I'll be bound. Huh! Fatty stepped back out of range of Mr. Goon's explosions. I heard a kitten mewing here, he said, still politely. And being a subscriber to the RSPCA, if you know what that means, Mr. Goon, I naturally had to come into the house to find it. Pah! said Mr. Goon, disbelievingly. This here house is absolutely empty. I've been through it myself with a tooth comb already. This here house isn't absolutely empty, said Fatty. Dear me, I seem to be getting muddled. Hark, Mr. Goon, can't you hear the kitten mewing now? Meow, said the kitten, and obligingly crept out from under the hall stand. It went to Fatty and rubbed affectionately against his legs. Then it looked at Mr. Goon, hissed at him and spat. Most intelligent behaviour, observed Fatty. I hope you believe in the kitten now, Mr. Goon. Mr. Goon did. He had to. Take it away and take yourself off too, he said to Fatty. I've work to do here, and keep out of this, see? You'll be careful of the dog here, won't you, Mr. Goon? said Fatty. I'm not quite sure where it is. You may possibly hear it growling somewhere and trace it by that. There's no dog here, said Mr. Goon, stalking past Fatty. A kitten I might have missed, being so small like, but not a dog. What do you take me for? It would be better not to tell you, murmured Fatty. Not here, anyway. He was just behind the policeman, and it was as well for Mr. Goon that he couldn't see the innocent expression on Fatty's face, a look that all his school teachers knew only too well. A blood curdling growl suddenly came from somewhere in the house. Mr. Goon stopped as if he had been shot. What's that? he said. Sounded like the dog, said Fatty. What a horrible animal it must be. I think I'll go, Mr. Goon, and leave you to tackle him. Another growl came from somewhere, and the policeman took two hurried steps backwards, treading heavily on Fatty's foot. Ouch! said Fatty. Look out where you're going if you want to walk backwards, Mr. Goon. Well, goodbye. I'll leave you now. You come and help me find that dog, said Mr. Goon, changing his mind completely about wanting Fatty to clear off. It might want two of us to get him. Funny I didn't see him or hear him when I was here before this morning. Fatty grinned behind Mr. Goon's broad back. He debated whether to produce another animal noise. This ventriloquism was most useful. All right, Mr. Goon, he said. If you think it's my duty to stay and help you, I will. I'm always around when duty calls, you know. Mr. Goon was very thankful. He began to tiptoe forward into the little dining room. Fatty followed a few paces behind. He suddenly gave a shout that made Goon nearly fall over backwards. Look, look! What's that? Over there! Look out! Mr. Goon was so anxious to get out as well as to look out that he almost fell over Fatty, trying to rush out of the room. Fatty clutched him as he went. It's all right! It's all right! I just caught sight of you in that mirror over there, Mr. Goon, and it was such a dreadful sight I thought it must be someone lying in wait for us. Gosh, thank goodness it was only your reflection. Mr. Goon was very angry and very relieved. He glared at Fatty. Any more of this funny business? He began, and then stopped suddenly. From somewhere behind came the sound of heavy grunting. Mr. Goon swung round at once. Did you hear that? he asked Fatty breathlessly. That grunting noise. What was it? It sounded out there in the hall. Yes, it did, said Fatty, clutching at Mr. Goon's arm and making him jump again. You go first, Mr. Goon. I'm scared. 
so was Mr. Goon. He tiptoed into the hall and promptly fell over the kitten which made a dart at him as soon as he appeared. He retreated into the dining room again, bumping into Fatty. The grunting noise was heard once more, this time sounding further off. It's a pig, said Mr. Goon, hardly able to believe his ears. Sounded upstairs that time. Did you think it was a pig, Frederick? The more frightened and puzzled Mr. Goon became, the more polite he got. At this rate, thought Fatty, he'll soon be bowing to me every time he speaks. He badly wanted to laugh, but he firmly thrust down the ever-mounting guffaw that wanted to rise up and explode. What sort of a fellow was it who lived here, Mr. Goon? asked Fatty innocently. Was he fond of animals? He seems to have kept kittens and dogs and pigs anyway. How was it I didn't see the pig when I was here this morning? marvelled Goon. I turned everything over and looked everywhere for clues, and yet I didn't see the dog or the pig. Shall we go upstairs to find the pig? Yes, but be careful the dog doesn't rush out at you, said Fatty. You go first, Mr. Goon. Mr. Goon didn't want to go first. He pushed Fatty in front of him, and then immediately wished he hadn't, because a deep and ferocious growl came from somewhere behind him. Fatty was certainly practising his new talent well. And then a new sound came to worry poor Mr. Goon. A voice came from somewhere, a groaning voice that said, I never did it! I never! Oh! I never did it! Where's my auntie? Goon listened, petrified. He began to feel as if he was in a nightmare. He whispered to Fatty, There's a man here somewhere. This beats all. We'd better get help. I'm not going to snoop round here with dogs and pigs and a man groaning. What's been happening since I was here this morning? Look, you stay here, Mr. Goon, and I'll go and get help, said Fatty, and moved firmly into the hall. But Mr. Goon clutched at him. No, don't leave me here alone. Can't you stay while I get help? Remember your duty, Mr. Goon, said Fatty solemnly. There is something strange here, and it's your duty to examine it. But it's not my duty. I'll go and get help. Goodbye. Goon held on to him tightly, and then the voice began again. I never did it. I never. Oh, I never did it. Where's my auntie? Goon began to shake. What's he mean? Talking about his auntie? He whispered. Come on, let's go. This is a madhouse, this is. Mr. Goon, why not telephone for help? Said Fatty. "'suddenly catching sight of the telephone in the hall. "'You'd get someone here in a trice, then?' "'Mr. Goon was so relieved at this bright idea of Fatty's "'that he almost embraced him. "'He stumbled to the telephone and dialed the number. "'Fatty heard him telephoning to another constable. "'He tiptoed silently out of the front door, "'grinning as he heard Goon's agonised voice. "'Send someone up here at once. "'There's a fierce dog in the house, and a pig. "'Yes, I said a pig.' P.I.G. Yes, pig, you idiot. And a groaning man who wants his auntie. Auntie! Yes, I did say auntie. Are you deaf or something? Well, how do I know why he wants his auntie? No, I'm not daft, but I soon shall be if you don't send someone to this address at once. Yes, I do want help. Yes, there is a dog here. And a pig. And an auntie. No, not an auntie, but a man who wants one. Oh, and there's a kitten too, I forgot to mention that. There was a pause as Goon listened to a few remarks from the other end of the telephone. He spluttered into it again. Any more sauce from you, Kenton, and I'll report you. I'm not having a joke with you. You come up here at once. At once, do you hear? Fatty heard all this and felt that he really must go somewhere and laugh. He tiptoed round to the back of the house where there was a shed he could go into and laugh in peace. He saw the broken casement window hanging open as he passed. He thrust his head inside and sent a terrible growl into the house. Mr. Goon heard it. He looked round and found that Fatty had gone. He was alone, alone in the house with a host of terrifying things. It was too much for Goon. He fled at top speed out of the front door and didn't stop running till he came to the bottom of the road. Fatty heard him go. And then he laughed.
How he laughed! It really was the best laugh Fatty had ever had in all his life. Chapter Eight. Laughter is good for the flu. Fatty's laughter echoed across the next garden and came to the ears of the others. They had retreated to Larry's house and had made their way into the back garden to wait for Fatty. Buster heard the laughter too and pricked up his ears. He began to bark delightedly, like everyone else. He loved Fatty's enormous laughter. Larry climbed up onto the wall. He gave the piercing whistle that the find outers sometimes used. Fatty heard it and saw Larry. Wait for me! I'm coming! He called. He was soon in the garden with the others. They retired to a little outhouse at the bottom of the garden. What happened? And why did Mr. Goon rush out of the house so suddenly at top speed? Asked Daisy. We saw him flashing by the gate like dark blue lightning. Fatty began to laugh helplessly again. The others had to laugh as they watched him. Pip gave him a punch, and Buster leapt on him in excitement. Why was his master so pleased? Come on, tell us the joke," said Pip. So Fatty told them, and soon they were all helplessly sitting on the floor of the outhouse, holding their sides, picturing Mr. Goon's amazement at the thought of the grunting pig, the growling dog, and the groaning man. That Auntie Bit, oh, what made you think of that? Groaned Larry, holding his aching sides. That's a touch of genius. Oh dear! Only an idiot like Mr. Goon would have taken all that in. What will Inspector Jenks think when Mr. Goon makes out a report full of pigs and dogs and men that want their aunties? That made them all laugh again. But Fatty began to look a little more sober. He rubbed his nose thoughtfully. I hadn't thought of Mr. Goon making out a report, he said. Yes, I suppose he'll have to. The Chief Inspector will smell a rat, I should think. Especially if he knows I was with Mister Goon at the time all this happened. He may not put you into the report," said Daisy comfortingly. "He'd leave you out if he possibly could. He hates admitting you were ever on the same job as he is." He telephoned for help," said Fatty. "Let's go and see if he's met his help and if they're coming back." Just as they got to the front gate and hung over it, with Buster doing his best to squeeze underneath. Mr. Goon came up the road with P.C. Kenton. P.C. Kenton had been most astonished to have Goon bump violently into him at the corner of the road. "I just came to meet you," explained Goon in haste. "Thought you might know where the house was. Come on." He scowled when he saw the five leaning over the gate. He especially scowled at Fatty for deserting him. "Gah, toad of a boy." However, he thought it best to say nothing whatever to any of them in case Fatty was funny at his expense. Fatty could be rude more politely than anyone Goon had ever met. I bet Mister Goon's friend will be puzzled to find the house completely empty of kitten, dog, pig, and man," said Fatty. He had brought the kitten with him to Daisy's. It had most conveniently jumped out of the window and landed at his feet while he had been standing laughing at the back of the burgled house. It was now playing with Daisy's kitten in a very friendly manner. P.C. Kenton was indeed astonished to find nothing and no one in the house of the kind that Goon had described. Not even Auntie, he complained. I was looking forward to seeing Auntie. You sure you weren't seeing things, Goon? I didn't see anything except the kitten. I heard them. I keep telling you," said poor Mister Goon, amazed to hear no sound of growl or grunt or groan. And to find nothing that could conceivably have made them, I can't think where Auntie's gone," said P.C. Kenton maliciously. "Don't keep on and on about Auntie," said Mister Goon, exasperated. "Auntie, whoever she was, wasn't here. The man just kept on wanting her. That's all. I keep telling you." P.C. Kenton was inclined to make a joke of the whole thing, and this infuriated Goon to such an extent that he began to exaggerate. If you'd been here and heard a dog growling, just about to leap at you, and heard a pig grunting and stamping about on the floor above, and then heard a man groaning and groaning at the top of his voice and dragging himself about the floor, well, you wouldn't have made a joke of it, I can tell you," said Mister Goon. "Well, 
All I can say is that the kitten, the pig, the dog and the man must have all rushed off together as soon as you left the house, said P.C. Kenton rather severely. You should have stayed and waited for me. Now we've lost all the animals and the man too. You'll have to make inquiries in the neighbourhood about them. See if anyone saw them rushing off together. Mr. Goon lost some of his high colour. He didn't think people would take him very seriously if he went round asking a question like that. He changed the subject, and after a while, the two policemen fastened the open window and went out of the front door, banging it behind them. The children saw them go. Mr. Goon crossed to the other side of the road with P.C. Kenton. He didn't want any awkward questions just then, and especially not from Fatty. They passed out of sight. A wonderful morning, said Pip with a sigh. I've forgotten all about the flu. I wonder doctors don't recommend this sort of thing for flu. I don't see how anyone can feel ill if they have mornings like this. I've never laughed so much in my life. What do we do now, Fatty? I want to know if you've anything to report to me, said Fatty. You had the job of going carefully round the house and spotting anything there was to see. Tell me what notes you made. We didn't get much, said Larry. We've pulled our notes together, and here's a short report. I wrote it out while I was waiting for you. Good work, said Fatty approvingly. Fire ahead. Larry read out his notes. We went carefully all round the house. We found out where the burglar came in. He didn't come in at the front door, but over the wall at the bottom of the garden. How do you know that? said Fatty at once. Well, there's a bed there, and there are very deep imprints of feet, said Larry. Only a person jumping down from the wall could have made such deep prints. Right, said Fatty. Go on. We traced the same footprints to a bush, went on Larry. Here the man must have hidden, as there are many footmarks all messed up together, as if he stood there for some time, occasionally peeping out. Got a drawing of the prints? asked Fatty. Of course, said Pip, producing a sheet of paper from his pocket and unfolding it. But it's not much help. We think the man wore Wellingtons, about size eleven. Anyway, the marks are exactly the same as our own Wellington boots make, except that ours are smaller. Right, said Fatty again. Go on. We found this cigarette end, said Larry, and passed a damp cigarette butt to Fatty. Can't tell much from that, though. We could only find this one, and that was under some leaves. I expect Mr. Goon found any others there were. We saw what must have been his enormous footprints everywhere, too, but we know those all right, so we could tell them easily from the others. Good thing Mr. Goon has such colossal feet, said Fatty. We always know his footmarks. Anything else? Oh, yes. We traced the footprints from the bush to the back of the house, said Larry, reading his notes again. We couldn't see them on the lawn, of course, but we could trace them on another bed and also on a very soggy gravel path by the back of the house. There are quite a lot of marks, all mixed up on the path under the broken window. He must have got over the wall, hidden under the bush, and waited till he judged the time right for entering, then crept up the garden and broken the window. There's a half brick just below the window. We think he broke it with that. Yes, probably, said Fatty. That means that someone might have heard him just then. We'll find out. Any more? Yes. There are other footprints, different ones, going from the front door, across the beds there in front of the house, then on a bit of the gravel path that leads to the back gate. Then no more, said Larry. They don't go straight from the front door to the front gate. If they had, we wouldn't have seen them, probably, because there are so many other footprints there now. I see. So you think someone else, probably Mr. Fellows, ran out of the front door, and instead of making straight for the front gate, ran across the front beds to the back gate and disappeared out that way? That probably means he went down the road, not up, said Fatty thoughtfully. Yes, that's all our notes, said Larry, shutting his book. And they're really good, too said Fatty. You've done better than old Mr. Goon, I bet. Now, just let me think a bit and try to piece together exactly what happened last night. Chapter 9 Is it a mystery? Silence while the great mind works, said Larry. Quiet, Buster! Shh! 
Fatty worked out his ideas rapidly. He was soon ready with them. This is how I see it, he said. Somebody wants something out of Mr. Fellows. What, we don't know. Anyway, whatever it is, the man must, for some reason, break into the house, probably because he feels sure that Mr. Fellows won't admit him if he comes to the front door. That means that he wants something that Mr. Fellows won't want to give him. Yes, that sounds right, said Pip. But why did Mr. Fellows tear out of the house like that? Now wait a bit, don't rush your fences, said Fatty. The man hides till he thinks it's safe to break in. Probably hoping that Mr. Fellows is asleep, then he can face him suddenly, possibly with a gun, and get what he wants. So in he goes at what he thinks is the right moment. I'd never have thought of all this, said Betts. It's like an adventure story, the way you tell it. In he goes, went on Fatty. But for some reason, he doesn't take Mr. Fellows by surprise. Perhaps Mr. Fellows has heard the breaking of the glass and has smelt a rat. Anyway, hearing the man getting in at the back window, what does he do? He shoots out at the front door, leaving it wide open, and rushes out into the dark, dark night. It wouldn't be so very dark, said Daisy. There was moonlight last night. My bedroom was flooded with it. You're right. So was mine. Good for you, Daisy, said Fatty. Well, to go on, he fled out into the moonlit night, possibly taking with him whatever it was that the other fellow had come for. The other fellow found the bird flown, but, not being certain if he had taken with him whatever it was he wanted, he proceeded to turn the house upside down to look for it. And he didn't leave any corner or drawer or cupboard or even the chimneys unsearched. You are clever to work all this out, said Betts. I never knew anyone who could put two and two together and make four so quickly. Ah, but where Fatty scores is that he makes them come to five, said Larry. He's always one up on Mr. Goon or anyone else. Mr. Goon makes two and two come to four, but old Fatty goes one better. Thanks, Larry, said Fatty, amused but also pleased. That's what all good detectives do. Now, the thing is, what was it that Mr. Fellows rushed off with? It can't have been anything terribly bulky or heavy, or he wouldn't have been able to run far with it, and someone might have spotted him and stopped him if he was carrying a suspicious parcel or big sack. So they might, said Daisy. Gosh, Fatty, if you work all this out much further, you'll be telling us what it was the man was carrying. I wish I could, said Fatty. But I think I've found something that might be a help, though how I can't possibly imagine. He produced the little red glove from his pocket. They all stared at it, and Buster sniffed hard. It's a doll's glove, said Daisy, or a baby's. Could it have been a baby's? I did play with the idea that Mr. Fellows had kidnapped a baby or some very small child, said Fatty. But I came to the conclusion he hadn't. There wasn't anything in the house to suggest that a small child had been there. Only this glove. Larry took the glove and turned it over. It's very clean, he said. It couldn't have fitted a child of more than two, I should think. Where's your big doll, Daisy? The one you had when you were three. It was nearly as big as you, then. She's packed away somewhere, said Daisy. I'll go and get her. Wait a minute. While she was gone, Fatty turned to Pip. You showed me the drawing of the burglar's footprints, he said. But what about Mr. Fellows's footprints? You saw them go from the front door, across the front beds, and on the path by the back gate. Did you take a drawing of them? Gosh, yes, I forgot to show it to you, said Pip, feeling in his pocket. He brought out a second folded sheet of paper and undid it carefully. Rather funny prints, these, Fatty. Smaller than the others, and rather flat and indistinct. Fatty looked at them in silence. I think Mr. Fellows ran out in his bedroom slippers. He said, This print isn't of proper shoes or boots with heels. It's a print of flat slippers. He may even have had on his night things and a dressing gown with bedroom slippers. He went out in such a hurry. If he was in bed or just going, he wouldn't be fully dressed. Yes, you're right. It is the print of flat bedroom slippers, said Pip. Larry, go and get yours. They're flat, aren't they? We could see what kind of footmarks you make in them. There's a nice muddy bit over by the wall. 
Larry fetched his slippers and came back with Daisy, who had found the doll. It certainly was a nice big one. Fatty tried the glove on its hand. Yes, whatever child this glove belonged to couldn't have been much bigger than your doll, Daisy, he said. But it beats me why the man dropped it, unless he was carrying a small child. He put the glove back into his pocket and looked at Larry, who was busy changing his Wellingtons for red bedroom slippers. They all followed him as he went to the muddy patch by the wall. Run over it at top speed, said Fatty. Larry ran, first up, then down. His mother, looking out of the window just then, was amazed to see Larry rushing up and down in the muddiest part of the garden in his bedroom slippers. She couldn't help noticing them because they were bright red. She knocked at the window and opened it. Larry, what are you doing? Stop that silly game at once. There, we might have known that Mummy would look out of the window at this very moment, said Daisy, and then called. It's all right, Mummy. We're just trying to prove something, that's all. Well, don't, said her mother. And please tell the others it's almost one o'clock. I'm sure Pip and Bets ought to be going home. She shut the window and disappeared. Fatty looked hurriedly but carefully at the flat, smooth prints that Larry's bedroom slippers had made. Yes, they're very like Mr. Fellows's footprints, he said, comparing them with Pip's drawing. Do they look the same to you, Pip? You got a really good view of Mr. Fellows's prints because you had to draw them. Yes, exactly the same, said Pip. Come on, Bets, we'll simply have to rush home. When's the next meeting, Fatty? Come to our house, will you? Right. Said Fatty, folding up the paper and putting it into his pocket. We'll meet this afternoon at half past three, unless anyone's got to have a rest because of what the doctor calls the aftermath of the flu, whatever that means. We've done some good work this morning, to say nothing of having had some great fun. Larry and Daisy went indoors with the doll and the red bedroom slippers. Pip and Bets shot off home. Fatty went more leisurely, his brain at work. There was more in this little happening than met the eye. Much more, he thought. It wasn't just an ordinary burglary, and Fatty very much doubted if the burglar had taken anything at all. I bet Mr. Fellows rushed off with whatever it was the man had come after, he thought. Where is he? Where did he put what he wanted to hide? Will he come back? Mrs. Trotville was out for lunch. So Fatty was able to have a long and satisfying meal all by himself in front of the fire. He thought about the new problem all the time. It wasn't really a mystery, not yet anyway, but it was certainly very interesting. When Jane the maid came in, she was surprised to find how much he had eaten. Dear me, yes, I do seem to have cleaned up the dishes rather, said Fatty, gazing in surprise at the empty tureens and plates. I've been thinking, and when I'm thinking, I like plenty of food for thought, Jane. <laughs> What's for pudding? French pancakes? Oh, good. How many? Ah, plenty of food for thought here. Jane laughed. Frederick was very funny, and no mistake. She went out to tell the cook to make another French pancake for Fatty. Fatty meant to work out a proper scheme for tackling this new problem immediately after lunch, but unfortunately, He fell fast asleep in front of the fire, with Buster curled up on the hearth rug beside him. He didn't wake up till the clock struck half past three. He leapt up in horror. Goodness, he ought to be at Pip's by now. He pulled on his coat, remembering his mother's orders to put on a scarf. He decided to bicycle with Buster in the front basket. He wouldn't be so late then. He arrived at Pip's. Ringing his bell furiously down the drive, much to Mrs. Hilton's annoyance. Why must Fatty always announce his coming? Really, that boy wanted taking in hand. He was getting too big for his boots. Sorry we're late, said Fatty, arriving in the playroom upstairs with Buster dancing at his heels. I fell asleep. Can't think why. We all did, said Larry with a grin. Another bit of the doctor's aftermath, I suppose. Pip and Bets were still asleep when we came. Well, we're wide awake now, said Pip, and Mummy says you can all stay to tea if you like, Fatty. Our cook has made a big chocolate sponge, so you're lucky. Mother says we can finish it between us if we like. That's one good thing about having had flu, 
said Bets. Grown-ups think we want feeding up, and instead of Mummy saying, Now don't be greedy, she keeps saying, You must have more than that, dear. Take a second helping. Long may it last. Everyone agreed heartily. Pip produced the rest of the bullseyes that Bets had bought him, and they all took one. They sat round the fire, their cheeks bulging, feeling happy and comfortable. Now, let's talk, said Larry. We had to break up the meeting in such a hurry this morning. Fatty, have you any plans? Is this a mystery, do you think, by any chance? I mean, it seems rather ordinary, really, after the mysteries we've tackled before. But even a little one would be nice before we go back to school in four or five days' time. There were groans at the last few words. Nobody felt like school, but they were all fit enough to go back now. I think, said Fatty slowly, I really do think this may be a mystery, and if so, we'll make the best of it. After all, a mystery, little or big, is always a mystery and has to be solved. I vote we get down to it at once. Chapter 10 a few good plans and a good tea. Everyone was delighted to hear this, of course. Buster thumped his tail on the floor as if he thoroughly agreed. A mystery. He'd be in it too, all right. You all remember what we worked out this morning, don't you? said Fatty. And you all know the few clues we have. Two sets of footprints and a small red glove and a cigarette end that really isn't worth anything as a clue, because, except that it proves the intruder smoked, we can't tell much more from it, not even the kind it was. Yes, that seems about all the clues, said Larry. By the way, said Fatty, remembering something suddenly, we know how the man got into the garden, hid, and then walked to the back window and got in. But does anyone know how he got away? I mean, he wasn't in the house the next day, that is, today, so he must have got away somehow. Any ideas? Yes, said Pip at once. We think he went out of the front door. We thought we could make out a few of his footprints in the general muddle of footmarks going up and down the front path. Anyway, there were none going back down the garden. I see, said Fatty. Yes, he probably did go out of the front door, and didn't bang it in case it attracted attention to him. It's a pity we can't find anyone who saw either of the men wandering about in the middle of the night, particularly Mr. Fellows, who was in bedroom slippers and, presumably, dressing gown. That's really what we ought to do next. Find someone who saw one or other of them that night. I don't see how we can, objected Daisy. We can't possibly find anyone who was out late that night and ask them if they saw a man in slippers and dressing gown. They'd think we were mad. Another thing we ought to find out is the time the man entered the house, said Fatty. That might give us some guide. Guide to what? asked Daisy. I don't know, said Fatty. We've just got to follow up every tiny little thing. Larry, do you know the people next door to you, at the house in between yours and Mr. Fellows? Yes, said Larry. The mother's help there has a boy. I talk to him sometimes. He's a great bird fellow, watches them, and knows all their names and calls. Is his bedroom on the side next to Mr. Fellows' house? asked Fatty. I don't know, said Larry. Do you want me to ask him if he heard anything funny in the night, like the breaking of glass, for instance? You might as well, said Fatty. You see, if we can get the time the burglar went in, say at three o'clock in the morning, we could perhaps find someone who saw Mr. Fellows somewhere at that time. Who? said Larry scornfully. I mean, how many people are wandering about at three o'clock in the morning? Nobody, usually, said Fatty mildly, except Mr. Goon at times. But there are such things as night watchmen. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, Larry. They're the men who... All right, all right, you win, said Larry, making a face. I should have thought of night watchmen, of course, especially as our roads are being done up now all over the place, and there are night watchmen to guard the tools and things left beside the road. Yes, you are right. A night watchman might have spotted Mr. Fellows in his dressing gown. Though don't forget, he might have pulled an overcoat on. If it was three o'clock in the morning, he would have his pyjamas on, and they would show under an overcoat, said Betts. It doesn't seem to me to matter whether he wore a dressing gown or a coat. He'd still look a bit peculiar with pyjama trousers and bedroom slippers. 
Well, do you propose that we go round to all the night watchmen of the district and ask them questions about dressing gowns and slippers? said Larry, not at all pleased with the idea. Bags I don't. Night watchmen are not awfully helpful in the daytime, if you can find them. They're sleepy and cross. Well, we'll go when it's dark then, said Fatty. They will presumably be wide awake then, if they have the job of watching to do. I think I'll go, but I don't think the girls should do this, and I doubt if your mothers would let you wander round in the cold night air, Larry and Pip. The aftermath of flu would prevent such goings on. What about you then? demanded Pip. Would you be allowed to? I shall probably feel the need for taking Buster out for a run tonight, said Fatty solemnly. My father has had to do it while I've been ill, and apparently Buster has played him up properly, run off into the bushes for ages and made Dad hunt for hours, and then he would find Buster waiting patiently for him on the front doorstep. Everyone laughed. All right, you take old Buster out for a nice long run tonight, said Pip, and enter into conversation with a few night watchmen. I can just see you sitting down on an upturned pail and warming your hands at one of those lovely holy buckets of hot cinders and talking nineteen to the dozen. And I'll have a word with the boy next door. His name's Herb, said Larry, short for Herbert. Or for Herbert, I've never found out which. He's a nice lad, anyway. I'll give you a phone call, Fatty, if I can find out anything. I'll slip in and see him tonight, lend him a bird book or something, and ply him with questions. Right. And if, as a result of your plying, you find out the time of the breaking of the window, it will be a help, said Fatty. I can ask the night watchman if they saw Mr. Fellows at some definite time then. It'll make it easier for me. How? asked Betts, puzzled. Well, I may have an uncle who sleepwalks and who was missing at a certain time last night and wants to know where he wandered to, for instance, said Fatty, grinning. Aha! I'm going to interest quite a few night watchmen in my uncle Horatius. I never knew you had an uncle Horatius, said Betts. Didn't you? He's the one that sleepwalks, I've just told you, grinned Fatty. And I've got an uncle Tobias who goes round at night looking for glowworms. Funny old fellow he is. The night watchman might have seen him, too. They all laughed, and Betts gave him a punch. You're an idiot. You've got an imagination that's too good to be true. Buster got up suddenly and ran to the door, standing there with his nose glued to it. Buster hears tea coming, said Pip. I wish I had ears like a dog. By the way, Daisy, how's the little kitten? Fine, said Daisy. It's a real darling. If it belonged to Mr. Fellows, and I suppose it did, he must be feeling worried about it. I'd hate to desert a tiny thing like that and leave it to starve in an empty house. He may come back, said Fatty. And if he does, that'll make a wonderful excuse for going to see him, Daisy. I can take back the kitten and ask him all sorts of innocent questions. Good idea. If he comes back, said Pip. Hurrah! Buster was right! It is the tea! He and Betts ran to the door and took in two large and well loaded trays. Thanks, said Pip, eyeing the trays with approval. Gosh, what a great chocolate sponge! It was a very fine tea. Hot, new made scones, sweet and buttery, strawberry jam, bread and butter, and potted salmon and shrimp paste, small ginger buns, shortbread biscuits, and of course, the large chocolate sponge, which had a thick cream filling. I vote we march down in a body to the kitchen after tea and give three cheers, said Larry. Well, flu certainly has its good points. Afterwards, I hope we shall all be fed just as much at school when we get there. We shall be, but not in quite the same way as we are being fed up now, grinned Pip, offering the scones round. I soon get fed up at school. Ha <laughs> ha, joke over, said Larry, biting into his scone. Gosh, this is the most buttery scone I ever had. Buster would just love to lick my face clean after it. It was a lovely tea, cosy, companionable, and full of silly jokes. Buster accepted titbits from everyone and was not above abstracting a biscuit from the plate when no one was looking. They ate everything, and Pip asked everyone politely if he should go down and ask for any more, but nobody could manage another thing. 
Buster thumped his tail on the carpet to say that he wouldn't mind a few more biscuits, but unfortunately nobody took any notice of him. They played a game of Monopoly after tea, but had to stop before it was finished. Both Larry and Daisy had been told to get home by quarter past six, as an aunt was coming to stay. Will you have time to go in and see that boy next door? Herb, didn't you say his name was? asked Fatty. Oh, yes. I'll leave Daisy chatting brightly to Aunt Pamela, said Larry. She's good at that sort of thing. Well, come on, Daisy, we must go. I'll ring you later on this evening, Fatty. They all went down to the kitchen and gave three cheers for their wonderful tea. The two maids were tickled and pleased. Go on with you, said the cook. You're only doing this to get as good a tea next time you come. Oh, there's Buster. Did they give you any tea, Buster? Buster drooped his tail as if to say no. Oh, you fibber, said Pip. Who stole a biscuit off the plate? You thought I wasn't looking, but I was. Good thing I was your host, or I'd have had something to say to you. Larry, Daisy, and Fatty went to say goodbye and thank you to Mrs. Hilton, who was always very strict about good manners. Then they went off together down the drive to the front gate. Fatty wheeled his bicycle. I hope I don't meet Mr. Goon. He said, I've got no light at the front. Well, so long, Larry and Daisy. Here's to the new mystery, even if it's just a tiddler. And don't forget to phone me, Larry. Right, said Larry. And good luck with your Uncle Horatius and your Uncle Tobias and the night watchman, Fatty. You'd better keep a sharp eye on those two uncles of yours in future. Chapter 11 Larry does a little work, and so does Fatty. Larry and Daisy arrived home just at quarter past six. Their aunt was already there. Larry chatted politely for ten minutes and then escaped, leaving Daisy to carry on the good work. He slipped up to his room and found his new book on garden birds. Herb would love to borrow that. He went in the gate of the next door house and made his way to the back door. He rapped four times. That was the signal to Herb that he had come to see him about something. Herb opened the door. Hello, he said. What's up? Nothing, said Larry. I just wondered if you'd like to borrow my new book. It's got every single garden bird in it. All the ones we get here, of course. Come in, said Herb eagerly. Mum's out. Let's have a look in the book. Cool, it's a beauty. Will you really lend it to me? Herb sat down at the table and opened the book. He would have been pleased if Larry had gone back home straight away and left him to it. Herbert was certainly mad on birds, Larry reflected. He wondered how to begin his questions about the night before, when suddenly Herb gave him just the opening he needed. Oh, here's a fine chapter on owls, he said, and what smashing pictures. I love owls. I'm always listening out for them. There, listen. One's hooting now. Can you hear it? A long and beautiful quavering hoot came to Larry's ears. He sat up at once. Herb, did you hear any owls last night? Herb looked across at Larry and nodded. Yes, I did. They like moonlit nights, you know. One owl came so near my window that I thought he must be calling for me to come and catch mice with him. I even saw him fly past the window, though I couldn't catch the sound of his quiet wings. What time did you hear him? asked Larry. Did you notice? Why, did you hear him too? said Herb, surprised. Let's see now. I heard owls before I went to sleep. About ten, that was. Then they woke me again about half past twelve. That was the one came to my window. I got out of bed and watched for a while then. Where does your bedroom face? Towards our house? asked Larry. No, it faces onto the next door house, said Herb. The one that was burgled last night. When I looked out about half past twelve, there was still a light on downstairs in the sitting room. Mr. Fellows must have been sitting working there like he often does. Sometimes he doesn't draw his curtains, and I see him sitting at a table. But last night the curtains were drawn. He'd got his radio on, I think. I'm sure I heard sounds coming from it. I suppose you didn't hear any owls after that, did you? asked Larry hopefully. There must have been a lot about enjoying looking for mice in the moonlight. Oh, there were, said Herb. Something woke me later on, but I don't think it was owls. 
I don't really know what it was. I switched on my light and saw it was quarter past three. I went to the window and listened for hours again, and I could hear some brown owls somewhere, and some little owls too, twitting like anything. Had the light gone out in the sitting room next door? asked Larry. Oh, yes, said Herb. But the funny thing was that I thought I saw some kind of light down in the kitchen, the room that faces our kitchen. Not the usual electrical light. Torch, perhaps, or a candle. This was all very interesting. Larry wondered if the light in the kitchen had been the torch of the man who had got in through the broken casement. Can't you really remember what the sound was that woke you? he asked. Would it be breaking glass, for instance? Well, it might have been, said Herb, wrinkling his forehead. Are you thinking about the burglary next door? Well, I dare say that might have been glass breaking, I heard, and it might have been the light of a torch I saw in the kitchen. I couldn't swear to it. I didn't take that much notice. He bent his head down to the book again and became completely absorbed in it. Larry got up. He didn't think he could get anything more out of Herb. Herb obviously took much more interest in birds than he did in burglaries. He didn't seem at all interested in the happenings next door. Goodbye, Herb, said Larry, and went back home. Herb and his owls. Larry hoped he would enjoy the bird book. He deserved the loan of it in return for all the information Larry had got out of him. He telephoned Fatty and told him the whole conversation clearly and concisely. Fatty approved. You are all getting really good at reporting things, he said. Thanks for such interesting details. I think there's no doubt that the burglar fellow broke the window at about quarter past three, and very soon after that, Mr. Fellows rushed out of the house, probably with the precious goods, whatever they were. That the other chap had come for. Well, I suppose you'll now decide that your respected uncle Horatius wandered abroad sleepwalking at round about quarter past three, said Larry, and half the night watchman in Peterswood will hear all about him, bedroom slippers and all. Quite right, said Fatty. How bright you are, Larry. <laughs> anyway, thanks for all you've done. Good work. See you tomorrow and tell you anything that happens tonight. That night, Fatty apparently went up to bed at eight o'clock, immediately after the evening meal. His mother approved. You've had a long day, and I'm glad you are sensible enough to go up early, she said. Your father and I are going out to play bridge. Don't read too late in bed, Frederick. Fatty duly promised, congratulating himself on his luck. He had been afraid that he would have to undress completely and get into bed in case his mother came up to say good night. Now he didn't do that. He heard his father get into the car. He heard it go purring down the drive and into the road. Good. Now he could act. He debated on a disguise. Should he put one on, or shouldn't he? It wasn't really necessary. On the other hand, it would be fun, and he was rather out of practice disguising himself these holes. Fatty decided he would do a spot of disguising. He took a torch, and he and Buster disappeared cautiously down the garden to the lock-up shed where he kept his dressing up things. He thought he wouldn't put on anything too noticeable. He didn't want to scare the night watchman, dreaming over their fires. He decided on a small toothbrush moustache, his false prominent teeth, and no wig, just his own hair. A cap of some sort? Yes, that checked one would do well. He'd wear it back to front. It would look very fetching that way. He chose a tweed overcoat, rather too big for him, and a blue spotted scarf. He looked at himself in the glass. Did he look like a young man asking for information about a sleepwalking uncle? He thought he did. He set off. He guessed he must go in the direction of the river because Mr. Fellows had gone out of the back gate, which meant he was presumably going in that direction and not up the road towards the hills. Now, where was the road being mended on the way to the river? Fatty decided regretfully to leave Buster behind. Too many people knew Buster. If they met him in company with a strange young man at night, they might think somebody was stealing him. So Buster was left behind, curled up on the rug in the shed. Fatty went to Mr. Fellows's house and looked at it. It was in complete darkness. He stood at the back gate and looked along the road. 
Yes, he would go down there, and when he came to the bottom, he would see if there was any sign of a night watchman's brazier of glowing coals. He walked down smartly. At the end, he looked this way and that. No sign of any watchman or of the road being up. He turned to the right and made his way to the next crossroad. There he had some luck. Red lamps burned in a row, and in the midst of them was the dark, shadowy shape of a watchman's hut with the brazier of burning coals in front of it. Fatty walked along. The watchman heard his steps and peered out. Good evening, said Fatty cheerily. Nice fire you've got there. Do you charge anything if I warm my hands, mate? Warm 'em and welcome," said the old fellow. "Everybody who comes by likes a warm at my fire, so we do." "Do you get many people late at night?" asked Fatty, spreading his fingers over the warm glow. "I mean, after midnight." "I get the policeman, Mister Goon," said the watchman. "Chatty fellow he is, handles a lot of important cases, so he tells me." And I guess a fisherman or two that likes a bit of midnight fishing. Nobody about then to disturb the fish, you know. I wonder if you've ever seen my uncle Horatius," began Fatty. "He's a funny old fellow. Walks in his sleep." "Do he now?" said the watchman with interest. "Yes, he do. Uh, does," said Fatty. "I suppose you didn't see him last night, did you? Wandering about in a dressing gown." Or perhaps a coat over his pajamas with bedroom slippers on his feet. The watchman went off into a cackle of laughter, just like a goose. Fatty listened to it intently. He could copy that at some time. Wonderful, cackle, cackle, cackle. No, I didn't see him," said the old man. "Good thing too, or maybe I'd have thought I were asleep and dreaming, and that's not a good thing for a night watchman to do. But old Willie. Him that's watching further along near the river, he did say something about a chap in pajamas last night. Maybe that was your uncle Horatius. <laughs> you should ought to lock him up, Mister. He'll get himself drownded one night sleepwalking near the river. Yes, I think I will lock him up in the future," said Fatty, delighted at this unexpected bit of news. I'll go and have a word with Willie. Hello, who's this? There was a ringing of a bicycle bell. And a familiar figure loomed up in the light of the nearest lamp post. Mister Goon, blow! What was he doing here? Chapter Twelve: A Little Night Prowling. Fatty moved off hastily, glad that he hadn't brought Buster with him. What a welcome Buster would have given the astonished Goon! The burly policeman got off his bicycle and went over to the night watchman. Fatty escaped into the shadows and hurried off to find Willie. A row of red lamps again guided him. He went down a long road towards them, seeing the flash of the river at the end. The watchman's little hut was set close beside the bright brazier of burning coals. Fatty introduced himself as before and brought his uncle Horatius into the conversation as soon as he could. He was afraid that Goon might turn up again. Why must he ride round the streets just when Fatty wanted them to himself? Willie the watchman proved rather a surly fellow. He answered very shortly indeed. You sometimes have people asking you if they can warm themselves by your fine fire. I'm sure," said Fatty, persevering in spite of the watchman's surliness. I bet my uncle Horatius always comes to warm himself when he goes sleepwalking at nights. The watchman grunted. He took no interest in Fatty's uncle or in sleepwalking either. You might have seen him last night," went on Fatty. "Came out in his pajamas and bedroom slippers." <laughs> The watchman looked at Fatty. "I seed him," he remarked, suddenly developing quite a chatty manner. Least ways I see someone running by, pajama legs and bedroom slippers he wore. Scatty fellow, I thought to myself, but he weren't old the way he ran along. Fatty was delighted. Ah, so Mister Fellows had run down this road. That was something. It only led to the river. Why had he gone down to the river? Was he carrying anything? Asked Fatty. Yes, he were. 
something in his arms like, but I don't know what it was, said the watchman. So we were your uncle, were he? Do we often sleepwalk? On moonlit nights, mostly, said Fatty, ready to invent anything now that he had got a little information. You didn't see him come back, did you? No, said Willie, and relapsed into surliness again. Fatty was about to say good night when he heard the ringing of a bicycle bell again. Surely, surely that couldn't be Mr. Goon once more. But it was. Fatty escaped from the light of the burning brazier just in time. Goon sailed up to the light of the red lamps and hailed Willie. Are you there, my man? I want to ask you a few questions. Fatty hid behind a convenient bush, a really worrying suspicion forming in his mind. Was Goon cross-examining the night watchman too, and for the same reason as Fatty was? Had he worked out the problem in the same way as the find-outers had? If so, Goon was growing a few brains. Well, Willie, said Goon, warming himself at the brazier, first his vast front, then his rather vaster back. You seen anyone suspicious last night? I'm on a case again, and I'm looking out for someone. You wouldn't be wanting an old uncle what sleepwalks and wears pyjamas and red slippers, would you? said Willie. Goon stared at him, astonished. Why? The old watchman away up the other road asked me that, he said. I thought it was just his joke. Who's been kidding you along to? A young fella, said Willie. Proper worried about his old uncle Horatius, he was. Old Jen was sleepwalks at night. Oh, and I suppose Uncle Horatius went for a sleepwalk last night, did he? said Mr. Goon, in such a ferocious voice that Willie was astonished. Here, what are you talking to me like that for? he complained. What was this fellow like who told you this fairy tale? demanded Mr. Goon. I didn't rightly notice him much, said Willie. My eyes ain't too good now. Young he was, tallish, a moustache of some sort. Mr. Goon gave an exclamation. Could the owner of the sleepwalking uncle be that boy? Was it that pest again, on the track of something as usual? Mr. Goon could have shouted in rage. The moustache was put on, of course. The sleepwalking uncle was made up. It must be. It was that big boy following the same clues that he, Mr. Goon, had so painfully worked out himself. Where was he? Where had he gone? If Mr. Goon could have got his hands on Fatty at that moment, Fatty would have had to yell for mercy. Now you listen here, Willie, said Mr. Goon, suddenly making a plan. You listening? Aye, said Willie. Speak louder, though. My ears ain't so good. Mr. Goon spoke up, much to Fatty's joy. What was he going to say? That fellow will come back this way, said Mr. Goon. I want to get my hands on him, see? So when you see him coming, you holler out to him. Get him over here and keep him talking. What for? asked Willie doubtfully. If he's a bad lot, I don't want to give him the chance of knocking me on the head. I'm going to hide at the other end of the road, said Goon, in case he spots me. He's scared of me, dead scared. If he so much as sees the lamp on my bike, he'll run for miles. And I want to get my hands on him, see? Now, when you see him coming, you take up one of your red lamps and swing it slowly to and fro in your hands. I'll be along at once while you're talking to him. All right, said Willie resignedly. What with people talking about sleepwalking uncles and red slippers and bad lots and swinging lamps, Willie was fed up. He'd never get down to a nice little snooze tonight, that was certain. Mr. Goon disappeared on his bicycle. He went to the far end of the river road, got off, and hid under a tree, his bicycle beside him. Ah, he'd catch that big boy on his way back. He'd have to come back that way because the river barred his way at the other end of the road. Fatty debated what to do. Should he cut down to the river, make his way across somebody's back garden, and cut into the road that ran parallel with this? Or should he play a little trick on Goon? He decided on the trick. Goon deserved one after saying that Fatty was dead scared of him. Fatty began to get to work quickly. He blackened his face with dirt, 
He twisted his cap the other way round, with the peak now shading his eyes. He put a white handkerchief round his neck instead of the scarf. He took off his moustache, but left in his awful teeth. He felt about on the waste piece of ground nearby. Was there anything he could use in his trick? His hand fell upon an old sack. Good, just the thing. Fatty groped about among the rubbish left by the road menders and came across pieces of brick and stone. He quickly slid them into the sack until it was half full. It was very heavy. He made his way back to the road and skirted round to the back of the watchman. Then he walked slowly by him, half bent under the sack. The watchman saw him, but his bleary old eyes couldn't make out who it was. He stared hard, in doubt, wishing the moon would come out from behind a cloud. He decided that whoever it was looked decidedly suspicious. It wouldn't do any harm to swing the red lamp to and fro. He picked it up, turned himself towards Mr. Goon, and swung the lamp slowly. Fatty grinned as he saw it out of the corner of his eye. He plodded on slowly, bent under the sack. If ever anyone looked a suspicious person at that moment, Fatty did. Mr. Goon saw the swinging lamp and came quickly down the road, keeping to the shadows, his rubber-soled boots making no noise. He tried to see if Fatty was there, talking to the watchman, but to his great annoyance, when he got to the little hut, there was no one there but Willie. "'Where is he? Why did you swing your lamp? He's not here!' said Goon, exasperated. "'I see a very suspicious chap shuffling down the river road,' said Willie. "'Not a chap as you wanted, but someone you'd like to get your hands on, I don't doubt. "'A real suspicious chap, and carrying a heavy sack, too. "'You'd like to know what's in that sack, I reckon.' "'Oh, it certainly sounds bad,' said Goon, "'thinking that if he couldn't get his hands on Fatty, "'it would be satisfactory to get them onto someone else. "'What direction did he go in?' "'Yonder,' said Willie, nodding. And yonder went Goon, keeping to the shadows, tracking down Fatty and the suspicious sack. Fatty took a quick look back. Good. Goon was on his trail. He would lead him a nice little dance. Down to the river plodded Fatty, and came to where the waves were silvery with moonlight. He turned down the towing path that led to the small jetty nearby, and Goon followed stealthily, breathing so hard that Fatty could hear him. Fatty walked slowly, shuffling one foot after the other, like an old, old man. He coughed mournfully as he went, a horrible, hollow cough. He suddenly stopped and put down his sack as if it was too heavy. Goon stopped too. Fatty heaved the sack onto his shoulder again and set off once more on his way to the jetty. He stopped suddenly again when he was almost there and put the sack down once more with a groan. Goon also stopped suddenly. He was very curious now. What was the old man doing with such a heavy sack? Where was he going? What was in the sack? Had he some accomplice he was meeting? Goon began to feel quite excited. Fatty hoisted the sack on his back once again and went on his way. He came to the little wooden jetty. Moonlit water splashed against it. Fatty went on to the jetty and sat down with his sack as if to rest. Now was Goon's chance. He emerged from the shadows and strode heavily up to the jetty, a big figure in the moonlight. Now then, he began, what's your name and what have you got in that sack? Bricks and stones, said Fatty truthfully in a sad, weary old man voice. Gah, said Goon in scorn. Nobody carries sacks of bricks and stones about unless they're mad. Maybe I'm mad, said Fatty, drooping his head down so that the moonlight didn't fall on his face. You open that sack and let me see what you've got, said Goon threateningly. No, said Fatty, clutching the sack as if it contained rubies and diamonds. Come on now, said Goon, advancing on him. You open that sack and be quick about it. Chapter 13 News from Herb It don't belong to me, said Fatty obstinately, still clutching the sack. 
Who does it belong to, then? demanded Mr. Goon. Shh! It belongs to Mr. Fellows, whispered Fatty, on the spur of the moment, and then was horrified to realise what he had said. Mr. Goon was amazed. Belongs to Mr. Fellows, he repeated. But how did you get it? Look here, you give it to me. You are acting in a suspicious manner, and you'll be arrested in a moment. He grabbed at the sack, and Fatty stood up, shouting dramatically, No, no, don't touch it! And then, more dramatically, he picked up the sack and flung it down into the river beside the jetty. He was very glad to get rid of it indeed. It made a most tremendous splash. Mr. Goon was bitterly disappointed. He had made up his mind that there was something very important in the sack, and now it was gone. He knelt down to look over the side of the jetty, and Fatty took to his heels at once. Mr. Goon stood up and gaped at the running figure. How could the old shuffling fellow run like that? Mr. Goon wondered if he was dreaming. He decided that he couldn't possibly catch the fellow. Why, he was almost at the turning into the river road now. What a strange thing to run like that after so much shuffling. A sentence floated into Mr. Goon's mind. Fear lent him wings. Well, Mr. Goon hadn't got any wings. He would have to walk back at his own pace. He knelt down again to look into the river, but of course he could see no sign of the sack. He made up his mind to come with a boat hook the next day and haul it up. He would find out what was in that sack if he had got to go into the water himself to get it. Willie was astonished to see yet another figure, this time racing past instead of shuffling past. The goings on there were in these times. It was quite certain he wouldn't get a snooze before midnight at this rate. That policeman would probably be coming back in a minute, too. Fatty fell to a walk after a bit. He guessed Mr. Goon wouldn't come after him. He felt relieved to think that the policeman hadn't recognised him. But whatever had made him say the sack belonged to Mr. Fellows? That was really rather idiotic and not fair to Mr. Fellows. Fatty felt distinctly uncomfortable about that. He got home without any further adventure, feeling unexpectedly tired. Buster gave him an uproarious welcome, and Fatty discarded all his clothes down in the old shed with the little Scotty dancing round him in delight. Then Fatty crawled tiredly up the garden path from the shed to the house. Gosh, I'm shuffling just like I pretended to, he marvelled. But shuffling's not so good when it's real. Fatty was so tired that he was almost asleep as he climbed the stairs. He fell into bed and immediately began to dream of red lamps following him in a threatening manner. He groaned in his sleep, and Buster pricked up one ear. Then Mr. Goon appeared in his dream riding on his bicycle, and fortunately the red lamps all attached themselves to him, so Fatty was at peace once more. At breakfast the next morning, the telephone rang. The maid came in and looked at Fatty. It's for you, Frederick, she said. Larry's on the phone. Fatty jumped up as if dogs were after him. There must be something up if Larry telephoned so early. He hurried to the telephone. That you, Fatty? came Larry's excited voice. Guess what? Mr. Fellows is back. I thought you'd better know at once in case old Mr. Goon doesn't know yet. Gosh, yes. Thanks for phoning, said Fatty. But how did you know? Herb told me. I was out in the garden with Daisy looking for one of the kittens that wouldn't come in, and Herb called over the wall to me. He said he was awake last night, listening to his precious owls again, when he heard the click of the gate next door. Go on, said Fatty. What time was this? He said it was about two o'clock in the morning. He went to his window at once, wondering if it was a burglar again, but he says it was Mr. Fellows. He saw him clearly in the moonlight, and he saw him again when he went into the house, because he switched the light on in the sitting room whose window Herb can see into, and it was Mr. Fellows all right. What was he dressed in? asked Fatty, excited by this news. He couldn't really see, but he thinks he had on a dressing gown. He wasn't carrying anything, though, so if he did rush out of the house with a parcel of some sort... He did, said Fatty. I found that out from a night watchman last night. Oh, good. Well, whatever it was, 
he apparently didn't bring it back with him. Do you suppose he was shocked to see his house turned upside down? No, he probably expected it, said Fatty. Well, I'll be along at your house after breakfast. Telephone Pip and Betts, will you? We'll have to think out our next move. By the way, Mr. Goon's on the same track as we are. He was very chatty with the watchman last night, too. Seems to me he's been setting his brains to work. Most unusual. Frederick, called his mother, your breakfast is getting cold. Do come back. Goodbye. See you later, Larry, said Fatty hastily, wondering just how much of the telephone conversation his mother had heard. He went back into the dining room and sat down. That was Larry, he said. We're all going to his house this morning, if that's all right, Mummy. You don't want me for anything, do you? Well, I was going to look through all your school clothes, said his mother, but it will do another time. Fatty groaned. School! I'm usually really pleased to go back, but this flu has taken it out of me. I'd like the holes to be longer this time. You look the picture of health, said his father, putting his newspaper down. And judging by the number of sausages you've eaten, you feel healthy enough, too. You'll go back to school on the right day, so don't try to get round your mother. I'm not, said Fatty indignantly. And sausages have nothing to do with how I feel. Actually, I was eating them quite absent mindedly this morning. What a waste of sausages, then, said his father, putting up his newspaper again. Frederick, I couldn't help overhearing part of your telephone conversation just now. I hope you are not going to get mixed up in anything to do with that absurd policeman again. Not if I can help it, said Fatty, spreading butter on his toast. Any news in the paper this morning, Dad? Plenty, and I'm quite aware that you are hurriedly changing the subject, Mr. Trotville said dryly. Fatty said no more, but chewed his toast. "'his mind dwelling on the return of Mr. Fellows. "'He would go and see him immediately after breakfast, "'taking the kitten with him. "'What a marvellous excuse for going! "'He would see what he could get out of him. "'He hoped that Mr. Goon also didn't know Mr. Fellows was back, "'but there was really no reason why he should have heard. "'Herb wouldn't have told him. "'Good old Herb,' thought Fatty, drinking his coffee. "'Herb had come in very useful indeed.' Good thing he was so interested in night birds. He wouldn't have been nearly so useful if his interest had been in house sparrows. Fatty took his bicycle and rode off to Larry's at top speed, with Buster in the basket. On the way, he saw Mr. Goon, also on a bicycle, far in the distance. The policeman saw Fatty and waved to him frantically. He had a few questions to ask him about the night before. Fatty knew that. He certainly wasn't going to stop. He waved back cheerily, as if he thought that Goon was simply being friendly. The policeman pedalled furiously to catch up Fatty. Blow him, thought Fatty, and pedalled as fast as he could. He turned a corner, leapt off his bicycle, and disappeared with it into the garden of an empty house. He crouched behind the fence. Mr. Goon came by, purple and panting, and sailed up the road, marvelling that Fatty could disappear so swiftly. Fatty came out quickly, mounted his bicycle, and rode off in the opposite direction. Buster was surprised at all this, but hadn't even got out of the basket. Mr. Goon's on the lookout for me, thought Fatty. I'll have some awkward questions to answer. Blow him. Does he suspect it was me last night that he followed? I wonder if he's found that sack of bricks and stones yet. He said he was going to get a boat hook and drag it up. Well, good luck to him. It'll keep him out of the way for a bit, messing about in the river. He arrived at Larry's out of breath. Pip, Betts, Larry and Daisy were watching for him. Daisy was holding the kitten. Nobody's seen a sign of Mr. Fellows, said Larry as soon as Fatty came up. We think he may be lying low for a bit. Do you think you really should go and see him? I mean, he may not be at all pleased to see you. Can't help that, said Fatty. I can't miss this chance. I simply must question him before Mr. Goon gets at him. He took the kitten. Thanks, Daisy. Well, you funny little thing. You won't like leaving your playmate, will you, and going back to that lonely house? 
He left his bicycle at Larry's and went up the road to the next house but one, Mr. Fellows's. He looked in at the gate. Should he go to the front door or to the back? There was no sign of life in the place at all. Was Mr. Fellows pretending to be still away? I'll go round to the back, thought Fatty. I don't want Mr. Goon to see me standing at the front door if he comes by. He went quietly and cautiously round to the back. He looked in at the window there, the one that was broken. Nobody was about. Fatty debated with himself again. It was likely that Mr. Fellows would not answer any ringing or knocking if he was lying low. But somehow Fatty must get hold of him. How? Fatty racked his brains. And then a splendid idea came to him. It was quite likely that Mr. Fellows had been looking for the kitten. Now he was back. Perhaps he was worried about it. Fatty would stick his face close to the broken pane and meow as loudly as he could. If that didn't fetch Mr. Fellows into the kitchen, nothing would. Chapter 14 An Interesting Conversation A most pitiful, heart-rending noise penetrated into the kitchen through the broken window. The little kitten that Fatty was holding jumped when it heard his lifelike mewing. It suddenly added its own high-pitched mew. That's right, whispered Fatty. Keep up the good work, kitty. Mew as loudly as you can. Meow, said the kitten obligingly. Meow. Fatty listened. He thought he heard a noise in the house. It seemed to come from upstairs. Meow, 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 said Fatty piercingly. He listened again. Yes, certainly someone was moving in the house now. There were footsteps on the stairs. Then they stopped. Meow, said the kitten shrilly. It certainly was doing its best for Fatty. A man appeared at the inner door of the kitchen, the one that led into the hall. That must be Mr. Fellows, thought Fatty, looking at him closely. He was fully dressed, though Fatty had half expected him to be in dressing gown and slippers. He hadn't caught sight of the boy and the kitten yet. He was looking all round the kitchen floor as if wondering where the mewing had come from. He was a youngish fellow with a thin face and bright, intelligent eyes. His hair was smoothly brushed and he didn't in the least look as if he had rushed, panic-stricken, out of his house two nights before. Meow, said the kitten again, struggling to get out of Fatty's arms. The man heard the mew and looked across to the window. He saw Fatty's head and shoulders there and made as if to draw back at once. Then he saw that Fatty was a boy and that he was holding the kitten. He came forward slowly. Fatty guessed that he was annoyed at having been seen. He spoke apologetically through the broken pane. Sorry to disturb you, sir, but this is your kitten, isn't it? We've been looking after it through the, uh, upset. The man smoothed back his hair. He answered cautiously. Yes, it's my kitten. Uh, wait a minute, I'll undo the kitchen door. He unlocked and unbolted it. Fatty was at the door, waiting. The man stretched out his hand for the kitten, and Fatty sensed that once he had taken it, he would probably say no more than a word of thanks and shut the door. I say, sir, your burglary caused quite an excitement, said Fatty, holding on to the kitten. The police were here, did you know? Mr. Fellows looked startled. The police, he said. What for? How did they know anything about the house being empty or, uh, burgled? Fatty thought rapidly. Mr. Fellows hadn't heard then that the milkman had reported anything. He didn't know that Mr. Goon had inspected the house and found it upside down. Probably he hoped that nobody knew anything at all, either about the intruder or about his rushing out of the house. I'll tell you all about it if you like, sir, said Fatty, stepping firmly into the kitchen. Mr. Fellows now obviously wanted to know what Fatty had to say. It was news to him that the police had been into his house. He looked worried. He shut the kitchen door and locked it. He took Fatty into the little sitting room. 
Everything was now tidy and in its place. Mr. Fellows had obviously been very busy since he had got back, and had cleared everything up. The kitten followed, mewing. "'Does it want any milk?' asked Mr. Fellows, looking down at it. "'I'm afraid there isn't any. The milkman apparently didn't come this morning.' "'No, I expect the police told him not to, as you weren't here,' said Fatty. He sat down on a chair. "'What is all this about the police?' said Mr. Fellows irritably. "'Can't a man go away for a short while without the police coming in and snooping round? I think that is most unnecessary.' "'Well, you see, apparently burglars got in and turned the place upside down while you were away,' said Fatty, watching Mr. Fellows closely. "'Didn't you find everywhere in an awful mess?' The man hesitated. He quite obviously wasn't going to say more than he needed to. "'Yes, but I'm an untidy person,' he said. "'Ah, uh, who did you say raised the alarm to the police?' "'The milkman.' said Fatty, stroking the purring kitten. He found the front door wide open when he came to leave your milk yesterday morning, walked in, saw the confusion, and telephoned the police. I see, said Mr. Fellows. This is all news to me. What time did you leave your house, then? asked Fatty suddenly. He knew quite well what time it had been because of Herb's information, but he wanted to see what Mr. Fellows had to say. The man hesitated again. "'Oh, uh, sometime that night,' he said. "'I, uh, went to visit a friend and stayed the night with him. I came back last night to find the house a little untidy, certainly, but nothing has been stolen as far as I can see. I don't see why the police had to butt in without my permission.' "'Because of the open front door,' said Fatty patiently. "'I suppose you did shut the front door after you when you went out, Mr. Fellows.' "'Of course,' said the man, but Fatty didn't believe him. He felt sure that Mr. Fellows had probably only pulled it too, not wanting the intruder in the house to hear him go. It was the intruder who had left it wide open. Fatty debated whether or not to ask Mr. Fellows what he had been dressed in when he had left the house. He decided that he wouldn't. He would only be more on his guard than ever, and would anyhow lie about it. Fatty glanced at him. He looked extremely clean and tidy and well-brushed. Not a bit like my Uncle Horatius, thought Fatty. Now, if I want to find out if he really did wander about in a dressing gown and bedroom slippers, I'll somehow have to slip upstairs and snoop round for them. But how? All conversation suddenly came to an abrupt end. A big red face unexpectedly appeared at the sitting-room window and looked in. The face owned a helmet. It was Goon. Mr. Fellows gave an exclamation. Who's that? Of all the brazen cheek, it's the police again. What do they think they're doing, snooping and prying on private property like this? I'll put this fellow where he belongs. I certainly would if I were you, Fatty agreed fervently. A man can't call his house his own these days. Are you going to let that policeman in, sir? He's speaking to you. Goon had just been on his rounds, and had, as a matter of routine, called in at Mr. Fellows's house to see if anything had happened there. As there was no smoke from the chimneys, and everything seemed quiet, he hadn't done anything but peep in at the windows. He wasn't going to enter that house alone again if he could help it. He could hardly believe his eyes when he saw Fatty sitting there with a man who must be Fellows. He gaped at them both. Then a familiar rage boiled up in him. That boy! That toad! There he was again, poking his nose in, and getting it there before he, Mr. Goon, could get in his. How did he do it? Open the door, sir, bellowed Mr. Goon. I have a few words to say to you. Mr. Fellows glared at the red-faced policeman. He strode to the window and opened it. What do you mean by peering in like this at my window? Mr. Fellows asked in a furious voice. Can't you see I'm sitting here talking to a friend? What's the matter with you? A, a friend? Choked Mr. Goon, glaring at Fatty. Is that boy your friend? I shall report you for this extraordinary behaviour, said Mr. Fellows. My house is my own, and I am not aware that I have done anything to cause the police to pry into it. But, but, there's been a burglary, 
spluttered Mr. Goon. The house was all upside down and... There has been no burglary, said Mr. Fellows. As far as I know, not a single thing has been stolen. As for the house being untidy, well, I'm an untidy person. I can turn my own house upside down if I want to, can't I? The front door was wide open, persisted Mr. Goon, angry and bewildered. I'm forgetful, said Mr. Fellows. I do sometimes forget to close my doors. Now clear off! Do you hear me? Clear off! Fatty could have hugged himself in joy. Goon was always yelling at people to clear off, and now here was someone yelling the same thing at him. But the policeman had not finished yet. Well, let me tell you, you've no right to go away and leave animals to starve in the house, he said. The kitten is quite all right, said Mr. Fellows coldly, and was about to shut the window when Mr. Goon put an enormous dark blue arm in to stop him. What about the dog? he said. And the pig! Mr. Fellows stared at Mr. Goon as if he had suddenly taken leave of his senses. What dog and what pig? he demanded. Are you crazy, constable? Oh, and what about the fellow who kept crying out and wanted his auntie? said Mr. Goon, trying to force the window open. Mr. Fellows was now quite convinced that Mr. Goon was raving mad. He turned to speak to Fatty, but Fatty was not there. No. Fatty had seen a chance to creep upstairs and examine bedroom slippers and dressing gowns, and also pyjamas. Reluctant as he was to leave the battleground on which Mr. Fellows and Mr. Goon were squabbling so fiercely, he felt that he couldn't miss this chance. He picked up the kitten and tiptoed out of the room. He wanted the kitten with him to provide him with an excuse for going upstairs. Why should anyone think it odd if the kitten fled upstairs and needed looking for? Up the stairs went Fatty, grinning to hear Mr. Goon shouting the question about the dog and the pig. Gosh, Mr. Fellows would think he was quite mad. He saw that everywhere had been tidied up. He tiptoed into the biggest room, which he guessed was Mr. Fellows' bedroom. Now, where were his slippers and pyjamas and dressing gown? Chapter 15 Fatty is pleased. Fatty looked round the room. No slippers to be seen. He looked under the bed. Ah, a pair of red slippers lay there, rather like Larry's, but bigger. Fatty turned them upside down and examined them. They were muddy, very muddy. Mud had even got splashed on the tops of the slippers. It was quite obvious that Mr. Fellows had been wandering about the streets in these. Fatty slipped his hand under the eiderdown and pulled up pyjamas, striped red and white. He gave a low whistle. The bottom edges of the legs were filthy dirty, splashed with mud and clay. Fatty nodded his head. Yes, that muddy clay down by the river. Now for the dressing gown. It was hanging in a tall cupboard. It was dirty, but it was also messed up with hay and straw. Strands stuck out here and there. Where had Mr. Fellows been in his dressing gown? Fatty thought rapidly as he shut the cupboard door. He didn't go to stay with a friend. He hid somewhere for the rest of that night and all day yesterday because he didn't want to be found in his night clothes. Questions would be asked. He hid in a barn or in a haystack or rick and crept home in the middle of last night. I bet the watchmen were surprised to see him again if they spotted him. Gosh! They'd think my uncle Horatius had been out again. The angry voices downstairs had stopped. There was the sound of a window being slammed shut. Fatty dropped down on his hands and knees and began calling. Puss, puss, where are you? Kitty, kitty. A voice came up the stairs. What are you doing up there? Come down at once. Sorry, said Fatty, appearing at the top of the stairs. The kitten's run away. It's down here, said Mr. Fellows. He still looked very angry. You clear off now. Thanks for seeing to the kitten. I've ticked that interfering policeman off and he's gone. I've a good mind to report him. I should, sir, said Fatty earnestly. I think he must be mad, said Mr. Fellows, pacing nervously up and down. Talking about dogs and pigs and aunties. 
Fatty wanted to laugh. He glanced round and decided that there really wasn't any more to get out of Mr. Fellows or to hunt for in the house. He had done very nicely. Well, goodbye, sir, and I hope the kitten will be all right now, said Fatty. Sorry to intrude and all that. Fancy you not having a burglar after all. Well, I didn't, snapped Mr. Fellows. Clear out now. I want some peace. Fatty cleared out, whistling softly. A most interesting interview. And how nice to find that all his ideas had been right. Those muddy slippers. My word, if Mr. Goon got into the house and did a bit of snooping, he would find a few things to interest him, too. Mr. Goon was lying in wait for Fatty. He emerged from behind a tree as Fatty turned down the road to go to Larry's. Ho! Huh! said Mr. Goon, his face purple. Ho! Huh! He seemed quite unable to say anything else for the moment. Ho to you, said Fatty politely. Many hoes. Mr. Goon went a deeper purple. So you're his friend, are you? He said in a choking voice. That's a bit of news, that is. I'm so glad, said Fatty politely, trying to edge past. Do you know what you are? said Mr. Goon, losing the rest of his temper with a rush. You're a pest, a toad. But I've sent him a report, see, and you'll be sorry. I don't see why, said Fatty. I do hope you've put in the kitten, the dog and the pig, not forgetting Auntie. There wasn't any Auntie, shouted Mr. Goon. He just wanted his auntie. Gah! What with you and Kenton and that fellow up yonder, my life's not worth living. No, it's a poor sort of life, agreed Fatty, suddenly seeing Larry and Daisy out of the corner of his eye in Larry's front garden. He hoped and prayed they had got Buster with them and would have the sense to let him out of the gate. I suppose you think I don't know it was you muddling those night watchmen last night, began Goon again going off on a new tack with a new grievance. Your Uncle Horace! Pah! My Uncle Horatius, corrected Fatty. Don't muddle up my uncles, please. Mr. Goon advanced on him, ready to tear Fatty limb from limb. Never had he felt so angry in his life. Poor Mr. Goon. He was muddled and bewildered and so exasperated that he didn't know which way to turn. Woof! 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 With a delighted volley of barks, Buster suddenly shot out of Larry's front gate at sixty miles an hour. He was thrilled to see Fatty, and equally thrilled to see Mr. Goon, though for rather a different reason. He leapt up at Fatty, gave him a hurried lick, and then leapt at Mr. Goon. The policeman was defeated. Fatty was bad enough, but Fatty plus Buster was too much. Mr. Goon gave the biggest snort of his life, flung himself on his bicycle and wobbled down the hill, one of his feet slipping frantically on a pedal. Buster flew after him, leaping and pouncing in delight. Fatty began to laugh. He staggered into Larry's gate. Larry held him up, laughing too. The other three were there, and they made their way to the shed at the bottom of the garden. Fatty collapsed on the ground, quite weak with excitement and laughter. They held a very interesting meeting. Everyone hung on Fatty's words as he described his peculiar interview with Mr. Fellows, Goon's sudden appearance, and all that Fatty had discovered in his snooping upstairs. Wow! Then all your reasoning was correct, said Betts in admiration. Every single thing. He did rush out in pyjamas and dressing gown and slippers, and he came back in them too, after sleeping and hiding somewhere. Yes, but we still don't know what he took with him when he went, or where he has hidden it, said Fatty. According to Herb, he had nothing with him when he returned. He wouldn't anyway, I suppose, because it would be senseless to take back whatever it was that was so valuable. He might find the burglar waiting for him again. Yes, he's hidden it, said Larry. I wonder where. We can't very well hunt in all the haystacks and ricks round about Peterswood. There are dozens of them. He's very careful in all he says, said Fatty. There's something going on. I wonder what it is. Gosh, we must try and find out before we go back to school. An unfinished mystery. How disgraceful. Everyone agreed, but nobody could see for the life of them how they could get any further. 
Mr. Fellows was not likely to help them. He had something he badly wanted to hide, that was certain. Could they possibly go hunting in stacks and ricks? The farmers wouldn't be at all pleased. Fatty told the others about his escapade of the night before. They laughed delightedly. Oh, Fatty, said Betts, I never knew anyone like you in my life, and I never shall. There's just nothing you're scared of doing. I was a bit scared of old Mr. Goon just now, said Fatty. Honestly, he looked like an angry bull. I don't blame him. I must be pretty annoying. I was really glad when Buster came flying out. Woof! said Buster, thumping his tail approvingly. Do you think Mr. Goon has got that sack of yours out of the river yet? said Daisy. Whatever will he say when he finds it is full of stones and bricks? He doesn't know it was you who dumped it there, does he? No, but he'll guess it was when he finds what's in the sack, grinned Fatty. You should have seen me heave it in. Old Mr. Goon nearly went in after it. Do you think he's gone to look for it now? asked Bats. He wouldn't leave it too long, would he? Let's go for a walk down to the river and see if he's anywhere about. We can bite down. Yes, let's, said Daisy. You've been having all the fun, Fatty. We want some now, too. I'd just love to see Mr. Goon digging about with a boat hook and bringing up a sack full of stones and bricks. All right, we might as well, said Fatty, getting up. Walky! Walk, Buster! Come on! They got on their bicycles. Pip and Betts had theirs at Larry's, as they had bicycled there that morning. They freewheeled down the hill towards the river. Mr. Goon was not there. Fatty spotted an old boatman friend of his, painting a boat outside his shed. He put his bicycle by a tree and hailed him. Hello, Mr. Spicer. Getting ready for spring weather. It's been pretty cold lately, hasn't it? Oi, that it has, agreed old Spicer, beaming at the five children. He knew them all. Why aren't you back at school yet? Term hasn't begun, said Fatty. Are you letting out any boats yet, Mr. Spicer? I suppose we couldn't have one this morning. No, I've only got the one ready that you see down there, said Spicer, nodding his head towards a little, freshly painted boat bobbing by the bank. Well, why can't we have her? demanded Larry, feeling that he would like a good row more than anything else. That Bobby rang up and asked me to have one ready for him this morning, said Spicer. What's his name now?、Uh, Moon? Ah, Mr. Goon, you mean, said Fatty. He winked at the others. So, Mr. Goon was going to come and jab about in the river for the sack that Fatty had thrown in. Good. Aye, Mr. Goon. Wants a boat hook, too, said Old Spicer, painting a bright red line with a steady brown hand. Seems like my boat hooks are popular this morning. <laughs> He's the second one wants a boat hook. Fatty pricked up his ears. Who's the other fellow who wants a boat hook? he asked, wondering if it was Mr. Fellows. Maybe he wanted to fish out a sack himself. I never seen him before, said Spicer. Big fellow. Got a scar down his cheek and something wrong with one eye. Not a nice piece of work at all, he wasn't. He offered me ten pounds for the loan of my longest boat hook. Said he wanted specimens of the weeds growing up and down the river for some botanist fellow. I see, said Fatty. The man wasn't Fellows, that was certain. Could he be the would be burglar, the intruder who had caused Fellows to fly out of his house with a bundle of some kind? Chapter Sixteen Down by the River. The others were all very interested in this piece of news, too. They nodded to Mr. Spicer and walked off till he was out of hearing. Strange, said Fatty in a low voice. I don't believe that yarn about jabbing for weeds at the bottom of the river. Let's see if we can find the fellow. Don't let's get too far away, begged Betts. I don't want to miss Mr. Goon hunting for your sack, Fatty. Well, You four go and watch Mr. Goon when he comes, and I'll saunter up the towpath as soon as I've asked Mr. Spicer where the other fellow went, said Fatty. Perhaps it would be as well if I wasn't here when Mr. Goon finds that sack and opens it. He might throw the stones and the bricks at me. He went back to ask Spicer in which direction the man with the boat hook had gone. 
I'm interested in water weeds myself, said Fatty, quite truthfully. There were very few things that Fatty was not interested in. He went up yonder, said the old boatman, pointing up the towpath. He can't have got very far. Fatty went up the path, leaving the others sitting on a seat just inside Spicer's shed. From there, they could easily see when Mr. Goon came down to the boat. They waited expectantly, hoping for some fun. Fatty wandered up the towpath, keeping his eyes open for the man that Spicer had described. He soon saw him coming back down the path. He had a pail with him, out of which water weed was hanging. Fatty wondered for a moment if the man really was getting weed for a botanist. Fatty stopped as the man came up to him. Got any snails in your weed? he asked politely. I want some for my garden pond. Get some yourself then, said the man in a surly tone. He turned his back on Fatty and looked down into the water. Can I help you? asked Fatty. I know a bit about water weed. The man turned round, scowling. I don't like boys who hang round, he said. You're not wanted, see? Buzz off. Fatty didn't buzz off. He merely sauntered on till he came to a clump of thick bushes. He disappeared round them, forced his way into the centre, and parted a few branches to look through. The bushes were of evergreen box, and Fatty was very well hidden. He saw the man look back as if to see if Fatty was still anywhere near, but there was no boy to be seen, of course. The man went slowly on his way, looking into the water as he went. He came to a stop at last, and into the water went his boat hook. He jabbed and poked at something, and finally lifted it out. Fatty grinned. An old boot. Well, if he was collecting those, there were plenty in the river. But the old boot went back with a splash, and the man went on again, taking a look round every now and again as if to see if Fatty was still about. He jabbed again and brought up something that disgusted him. He threw it back quickly. Another jab, and up came a mass of weeds. He put some into his pail. That's just for show, Mr. Scarred Cheek, murmured Fatty, peering through the bush. In case anyone is watching you, are you thinking that Mr. Fellows has thrown the treasure, whatever it is, into the river? Or are you just a junk hunter wanting to make a few pounds on anything you find? No, I think not. Junk hunters don't pay money for the loan of a boat hook. The man went slowly on down the towpath. Fatty grew bored. What were the others doing? Had Mr. Goon arrived yet? Mr. Goon had. To the delight of the four watching children and of Buster, who had not been allowed to go with Fatty, Mr. Goon had arrived at full speed on his bicycle. He had jammed on his brakes, thrown his bicycle against a tree, and yelled to Spicer. Got that boat ready? And I want the boat hook too, please. I'm pressed for time. The boat's ready yonder, and the hook's alongside, shouted back Spicer. Goon grunted and went to the little boat. He got in and took the oars. The boat hook lay beside him. Off he went, and soon began to pant with the effort of his rowing. Come on! said Larry, jumping up. Let's go and watch. I'd better carry Buster, though, or he might try and leap into his enemy's boat. Let's not go too near till Mr. Goon gets Fatty's sack of stones and bricks, said Betts. Let's just saunter up and down and wait till we see him pull up the sack. Right, said Larry. So the four of them, with a struggling Buster in Larry's arms, sauntered up and down in the January sunshine. Mr. Goon soon spotted them and exclaimed angrily under his breath, those kids again. Good thing for that big boy he's not with them. I don't know what I might do to him with a boat hook ready to hand. He rode to the jetty. He had decided that it would be much easier to drag up the sack from a boat rather than from the jetty. Mr. Goon feared that he might overbalance if he had to bend down and jab about from the high little jetty. He stopped rowing when he came to the wooden jetty and drew in his oars. He took up the boat hook and peered down solemnly into the water. His own red face peered back at him. Mr. Goon looked deeper down and tried to see the bulk of a sack somewhere. But the water was very deep just there, and try as he could, he could not see the bottom. 
He looked up at the jetty. Now, where had that old fellow been standing when he dropped the sack into the water? Yes, just about there. Mister Goon began to prod and jab where he thought the sack might be. He got hold of nothing but water weeds. He pulled up hundreds of green, slimy strands and exclaimed in annoyance, "Weeds, weeds, weeds! Where was that sack?" He'd find out what that old man had got in his sack if it took him all morning to do it. Mister Goon got very hot, jabbing here and there. He suddenly sensed somebody looking at him and glanced up. He frowned. Those kids! Now they had come to watch him. Like mosquitoes they were, always buzzing round him. Pity he couldn't slap them all away. Ah, what was this? His boat hook really had got hold of something this time, something fairly solid too, and fairly heavy. This must be the old man's sack. Mister Goon puffed and panted, heaved and hauled, trying to raise the sack. It came up with a rush, and Mister Goon nearly fell overboard. The four watching children gasped and winked at one another. Mister Goon had got the sack! Hurrah! Now what would happen? They walked right onto the jetty to see. Some way off, the man with the boat hook stood, also watching. His attention suddenly caught by Mister Goon's antics. A little way behind him stood Fatty, ready to dart into Spicer's shed if Goon's anger was too great. Mister Goon was so excited that he didn't even notice all these spectators. He heaved the bundle into the boat. Larry looked at it intently. It didn't look to him like a sack; it looked more like a laundry bag or something like that. Was it Fatty's sack that Goon had got, or was it something else? Goon looked at the dripping bundle. He saw that it was a bag, not a sack, but he didn't worry about that. He had only seen the bundle on Fatty's back by moonlight. Bag or sack? He was absolutely certain that this was what the old man had thrown into the river last night. He undid the string that tied the neck. He opened it wide. He put in his hand, wondering what he was going to find. The result of several burglaries, he had no doubt. Ah, a big stone. That would be to weight it down. And another stone, and another. Goon fished them out rapidly and tossed them into the water. Splash. The watching children now felt sure that this was Fatty's sack. Look at all the stones! But now Mister Goon was rummaging deep in the bundle. His face took on a puzzled look. He couldn't feel anything except soft, dripping clothes, or what felt like clothes. He drew one out. He shook it. An amazement spread over his face. It was a small red coat. He put it into the bottom of the boat. And delved into the bundle again. A pair of blue trousers, long ones, but far too small for a normal boy. Goon began to snort. He pulled out various things one by one: a red belt, a blue tie, a blue cap with a red button on top, a pair of socks, and finally a pair of small red shoes with laces. Goon couldn't make them out. Why would an old man in the night carry these things about in a sack? It didn't make sense. Why had the old fellow been so determined that he, Goon, shouldn't see into the sack or take it? Goon looked at the array of small garments, and his face grew purple once more. That boy, that toad of a boy, he must have been the old man. He had spoofed Mister Goon with a sack of dolls' clothes. Yes, that's what they were—dolls' clothes. That girl Daisy must have been in the trick too. She must have lent them to him, stuffed them into the sack, ready to trick Goon into thinking the old man had stolen something and to make Goon follow him. Gah! said Goon in angry disgust. Didn't he run like a hare when he dumped these into the water? I thought that was funny at the time. That boy was the fellow who talked to the watchman, and he was the old man too. He's too bad to be true. That boy. I'll not keep my hands off him this time. I'll get him and I'll stuff these things down his horrible neck. So I will. If I lose my job, I'll do it. Goon shoved the things back into the bag again. He was boiling with rage and his hands shook. He'd report that toad to the chief. He'd make the chief do something about him. 
he'd go round and complain to Mr. and Mrs. Trotville the things he'd tell them about that boy of theirs. He took up the oars and rowed away from the jetty, muttering to himself. The four children, seeing him look so fierce, decided to go back and warn Fatty. They set off on the towpath at top speed. They came up to Fatty, who was grinning. He had been too far away to see what had been taken out of the bundle. All he had seen were the three stones being tossed into the water. He had thought, of course, that they were some of the stones he had put into his own sack. Fatty, Goon's got some other sack, not yours, said Daisy in an urgent voice. It was full of clothes, doll's clothes they look like. I'm sure he thinks you put them there to spoof him. You'd better go quick before he comes. He's simply furious. Chapter 17 A Wonderful Scrimmage and a Discovery Fatty listened. He was suddenly very interested. Clothes? That was a funny thing for anyone to dump into the river in a sack. Goon had got the wrong sack. He would, of course. I'll pop into old Mr. Spicer's shed, I think, said Fatty. I'd like to see what Mr. Goon does when he lands. He won't spot me in the shed. He disappeared into the big dark shed and sat down on an upturned boat. The four children turned to watch Goon rowing nearer and nearer. The scarred-faced man also watched, looking very interested in the rowing policeman. He had given back his boat hook, and now it had only his pail of waterweed. Goon, still purple in the face, drew into the bank. He threw the mooring rope over a post and clambered out, the boat rocking dangerously under his weight. He picked up the bag into which he had stuffed the wet clothes. He looked at the four children nearby, scowling. Where's that friend of yours? I want him. I've got a few things to say to him. What friend? asked Larry innocently. Goon's scowl became even more ferocious. You know who I mean. That toad of a boy, spluttered the angry policeman. The old boatman heard him. He was still painting his boat and looked amused at Mr. Goon. He's in there, he said, pointing to the shed. What are you going to do to him, Mr. Goon? In there, said Mr. Goon, delighted. Aha! Now he'd show that boy something. He strode into the dark shed, determined to do or die this time. He'd stuff these things down that boy's neck till he yelled. He'd smother him with them. That would teach him to play tricks on him again. Fatty was taken by surprise when Goon walked in. Larry shouted a warning just too late. Goon was on Fatty before he knew it. And then... Mr. Goon had the time of his life. He caught hold of the seated fatty, held him in an iron grip, and began to stuff the wet, dripping garments down his neck, wrenching open his collar, tearing his shirt, but not caring in the least. Fatty could do nothing. He was half-choked to begin with by having things forced down the front of his neck, and Mr. Goon was extremely solid and strong. He struggled and heaved, and finally fell off the boat he was sitting on, landing on the earth floor of the shed. Still Mr. Goon went on relentlessly pushing everything down Fatty's neck. Trousers, coat, sock, cap, shoes, one by one, down they went. Goon was absolutely determined to punish Fatty this time. Larry ran at Goon, and so did Pip. They tried to pull the furious policeman away. Old Spicer heard the noise and came in, astonished. He stopped, gaping, when he saw the scrimmage. The man with the waterweed came too. He watched with great interest, very great interest indeed. At last, everything was down poor Fatty's neck. He felt wet and uncomfortable. Mr. Goon stood up, panting, feeling uncommonly satisfied with himself. You got what's been coming to you for a very long time, he panted. Now just you stop poking your nose into things, Mr. Nosy Parker. Stuffing that sack with rubbishy doll's clothes and stuffing me up too, making me think you were a bad old man with stolen goods. Oh, now you've been stuffed up good and proper. Mr. Goon, said Old Spicer in a shocked voice. You're a policeman. You can't do things like this. To a boy too. Gah, said Mr. Goon rudely. 
You go and boil your head, Spicer. That boy won't complain of what I've done, I know that. And why? Because he's been plaguing me night and day and interfering with the law. If he complains about me, I'll complain about him. But he won't. He's got a guilty conscience, he has. He's a bad lot, and one of these days he'll come to no good. Mr Goon, said Fatty, sitting up and trying to look as dignified as he could with dripping garments down his neck and hanging out of his collar. Mr Goon, I give you my word of honour I didn't spoof you with these things. I've never seen them before in my life. You owe me an apology. I owe you a lot of things, said Mr Goon. Yes, a whole lot, but not an apology. You put those things into that sack to spoof me, made me waste half a morning for nothing, and you got what you deserved. You got them in the neck. And what's more, you can keep them, or give them back to that girl to dress up her dolls. And, with a perfectly marvellous snort, Mr Goon marched out of the shed. He bumped into the man with the waterweed. Excuse me, began the man. I'd just like to know where... Mr. Goon snorted at him rudely and walked past, shoving him out of the way. He was feeling fine. Oh, Mr. Goon was on top of the world at that moment. He could have put the chief inspector in his place, too, with a few well-chosen words. If only he had been there. But he wasn't, which was perhaps just as well for the triumphant Goon. Oh, Fatty! Fatty, are you hurt? said Bats in tears. She was very scared. Oh, Fatty, are you all right? She began to sob. I'm fine, Bets, Fatty assured her, getting up and feeling himself all over. Don't cry, Bets, please don't. It was a wonderful fight. It wasn't, it wasn't, sobbed Bets. I hated it. I hate Mr. Goon. I shall tell the chief inspector. No, Mr. Goon only got back at me for all the maddening things I've done to him, said Fatty. He'll feel better now. You were wonderful to come to my rescue, Bets. Now please don't cry any more. That upsets me much more than Mr. Goon's attack. He put his arm round Bets. Cry, baby, interposed Pip, in his nice brotherly way. Calm down, Bets. Don't make a fool of yourself. Let her alone, Pip, said Fatty. She's really scared, and I don't wonder. Goon looked a pretty nasty bit of work when he flung himself at me. But what a peculiar thing to do, to stuff these things down my neck. Ugh, they're really wet and smelly. Let's get back home and fish them out, said Larry, seeing two or three interested children coming up on their way home from school. Come on, Fatty, we'll get our bikes. Mr. Spicer grinned goodbye and patted the red-eyed bets as she passed. The waterweed man stood silently watching. The school children nudged one another and grinned. Fatty really looked very strange just then. They got on their bicycles. Fatty had recovered now. He felt a new respect for Mr. Goon. Fancy him thinking of such a thing, and doing it too. Fatty shivered as he felt some cold, wet drops running down his chest. They rode to Fatty's house and went to his shed. They locked the door. Fatty looked round. Hey, where's old Buster? He never came to my rescue. He went off with old Spicer's terrier, said Larry, suddenly remembering. Spicer said his dog would show Buster how to catch rabbits in the fields behind the boathouse, and off they went. I never thought another thing about him. Things got so exciting that I forgot about old Buster. Well, I do think he might have come to my help, said Fatty, half vexed. He'd have enjoyed it, too. Free nips at any portion of Mr. Goon that he fancied. He'll come home when he's found out that, as usual, rabbits aren't really catchable, said Daisy. Oh, Fatty, you are wet. You'd better strip off your coat and shirt and vest and put on dry ones. Larry, you go indoors and get me some, said Fatty. Mummy's out, so she won't want to know what you're doing, carrying my underwear about. <laughs> Larry disappeared. Fatty took off his coat, pulled off his shirt and stripped off his vest. It was then easy to get rid of the damp, smelly things that Goon had put down his neck. Fatty looked at them in distaste. Nasty, wet things! Who could have been such an idiot as to dump dolls' clothes into a sack, weight them with stones, and sink them in the river? It doesn't make sense. I'll take them to the dustbin, 
said Daisy, gathering them up. That's the best place for them. She lumped them together. Trousers, coat, tie, shoes, socks, belt, shirt, everything, and went out to the dustbin. They heard her put on the lid, and then back she came again. Larry came in too with some clean, dry clothes. Fatty was about to put them on when he wriggled. I've still got something down me somewhere, he said. I can feel a nasty, cold, wet patch on my tummy. Perhaps it's a wet sock. Wait a minute. Oh, I really must get it. He wriggled his hand down and caught hold of something. Got it, he said. I thought I felt one last thing. It's a red sock. He flung it down on the floor of the shed and then began to dress himself rapidly in dry clothes. Betts bent down to pick up the little red woolen thing. It was limp and shapeless. It's not a sock, she said. It's a glove, a little red glove. Fatty swung his head round quickly and incredulously. Betts had got the little glove and was pulling the fingers straight. Fatty snatched it from her. A little red glove! Another one! he said jubilantly. The pair to the one I've got in my pocket! Where is it? Look! Exactly the same! He pulled the first little red glove out of his trousers pocket and put it beside the one that Mr. Goon had stuffed down his back. They were an exact match. Everyone stared at the two gloves. How very, very extraordinary! But what does it mean? asked Daisy at last. You found that first glove in Mr. Fellows's house, and Mr. Goon stuffed the second one down my neck. He's given us the biggest clue yet, said Fatty. Oh, dear, dear old Mr. Goon, you've nearly solved the mystery for us by stuffing things down my neck. Chapter 18 That Night There was a silence after this rather peculiar statement. Nobody could quite follow it. What did Fatty mean? Don't stand round me looking daft like that, said Fatty. Don't you see what this means? It means that the bag of clothes that Mr. Goon hooked up is the bundle that Mr. Fellows rushed off with and threw into the river to hide. The bundle that the other fellow was after for some reason or other. But how do you know? asked Daisy. Well, because I picked up one of the red gloves in a corner of the landing in Fellows' house, said Fatty impatiently. He must have pushed everything quickly into a bag to rush off to hide it somewhere, but one of the little gloves dropped out. Oh, I see. Said Larry. Yes, your red glove does prove that this bundle was the one that Fellows rushed off with in such a hurry. But, Fatty, why are these dolls' clothes so important? We'll get them and see, said Fatty. Daisy, go and haul them out of the dustbin again. We'll go through them carefully. There must be something to tell us why they are apparently of such importance. Daisy and Larry went off to get them, but just as they were going back to the shed with them, They heard the voice of Mrs. Trotville's cook. You children! Do you know it's nearly half past one? Your mother's been telephoning here for you, Daisy, and so is Mrs. Hilton for Pip, and Frederick's lunch has been waiting for him for a long time. Oh, blow, blow, blow! groaned Larry. Just when we were going to do something really exciting! He hurried to the shed and told the others. Fatty looked longingly at the bundle of wet clothes. Well, We must wait till this afternoon. Anyway, the clothes will be drier by then. I'll take them up to my room and dry them by the fire. Promise you won't examine them till we come back, said Betts urgently. I promise, said Fatty. Go on now, all of you, and I hope you don't get into a row. They all left at top speed, fearing that they certainly would get into a row. They did. Two really angry mothers met them at their doors. A quarter to two? What are you thinking of? The dreadful result was that not one of the four was allowed to go down to Fatty's that afternoon, nor even to leave the house. Larry and Daisy sat disconsolately in their playroom, and Pip and Betts sat in theirs. Fatty waited till three o'clock and then phoned. He wasn't even allowed to speak to the others. Larry's mother was cross. You should really not keep Larry and Daisy so late, she said. Fatty apologized humbly and gloomily. 
Mrs. Hilton said a good deal more. Fatty felt even humbler when she had finished. He could hear Betsy's voice calling to her mother at the end. Mummy, mummy, ask Fatty if Buster is back, please, please ask him. Mrs. Hilton asked him. Yes, tell Betsy arrived an hour ago, covered in sand and awfully hungry, said Fatty. I won't let him go off with old Spicer's dog again. He heard Mrs. Hilton's receiver click down. He turned and glared at Buster, who was sitting nearby, looking very guilty. To think you deserted me when Mr. Goon attacked me, said Fatty. Shameful dog, to go rabbiting when your master is in danger. Oh! Fatty went up to his room and looked longingly at all the things he had put in front of the fire. They were perfectly dry now. How he longed to examine them. But no, he had promised, and it simply didn't occur to Fatty to break such a promise. He bundled all the clothes into a drawer. The rest of the day was extremely dull. The mystery was at a standstill till the others could come and look at the curious clothes. Buster was still feeling guilty and was not at all lively. It began to pour with rain. The other find-outers were not allowed out at all that day. They sat and moped and sulked. How maddening to be kept in just when they really had got somewhere. Betts and Pip talked about the doll's clothes. Funny that they should be important enough for someone to break into Mr. Fellows's house and turn the place upside down for them, said Pip. I bet Mr. Fellows will be going out with a boat hook too to try and get them back, said Betts. Strange that those doll's clothes should be for a boy, not for a girl, said Daisy to Larry. How mad Mr. Goon would be to know that he had made a present of such an enormous clue to Fatty, said Larry. I guess nobody has ever had a clue stuffed down their neck before, just like Mr. Goon. They all went to bed early. Both Larry's mother and Pip's were still annoyed, and only Fatty's mother was good-tempered that day. But that was because she had been out to lunch and hadn't been kept waiting like the others. Fatty was tired. More aftermath! he supposed. He switched off his light early and fell into a sound sleep. His parents were up in town that evening, having driven up to a theatre and a dance afterwards. They would not be back until about one o'clock in the morning, perhaps later. At half-past ten, the whole house was in darkness, except for a small light left on in the hall. The two maids were in bed and asleep. Buster slept soundly too. So did Fatty. He was suddenly awakened by Buster barking loudly. Woof, woof, woof. He sat up with a jerk and turned on the light. A quarter to one. Shut up, Buster. It's only Mummy and Dad you can hear, said Fatty sleepily. Do shut up. Surely you know the sound of their car by now. But Buster wouldn't stop. He leapt from the bed to the floor and barked frantically. Fatty threw a book at him. Shut up, I tell you. It's only Mummy coming home. You know she and Dad are out. Come here, Buster. Buster took not the slightest notice. Fatty thought there really might be something the matter. He jumped out of bed, pulled on his dressing gown and opened the door. A frightened voice called to him. Frederick, is that you? Why is Buster barking? Is there someone in the house? I expect it's just my parents coming back, said Fatty. You go to bed again. Buster's gone downstairs at top speed, so you may be sure if there's anyone down there, he'll be after them. Buster was still barking frantically somewhere downstairs. Fatty decided to explore. He was about to go downstairs when he caught sight of his mother's bedroom. The door was open and the landing light streamed into it. It was in utter confusion. Gosh, said Fatty, switching on the light. Look at that! Burglars! while we were all asleep. He looked in his father's dressing room and into the guest room. Both had had their drawers and cupboards rifled and turned out. Fatty ran downstairs. Buster was standing by an open window in the sitting room, barking madly. It's no good barking now, Buster, said Fatty, glancing round the sitting room, which was in as much muddle and confusion as the other rooms. The thief is gone. He must have been about to come into my room when you heard him and awoke. He's gone out of the same window he came in by. I wonder what he's taken. Not Mummy's jewellery, I hope. 
there came the sound of a car up the drive. It was his parents returning home. Fatty heaved a sigh of relief. Now they could take matters in hand. Mr. and Mrs. Trotville were horrified when they came indoors and saw all the confusion in so many rooms. Mrs. Trotville rapidly looked through her jewellery and valuables. They were all intact. It's peculiar, she said after about twenty minutes' search. I can't see that anything has been taken. Even the pearl necklace I left on my dressing table hasn't been taken. What did the thief come for? Fatty suddenly knew. The intruder must have been the same one who had searched Mr. Fellows's house, and he had been looking for the same thing, the doll's clothes. But why? 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 Fatty raced up to his room to see if they were still safe. Yes, they were there in the drawer into which he had thrown them. What a blessing he hadn't left them down in the kitchen to dry, as he had first thought of doing. He had only taken them up to his room so that awkward questions would not be asked by anyone who saw such strange things drying on the kitchen error. But how did the burglar know that the clothes were now in Fatty's house? Fatty soon thought that one out. The man with the water weed. He had been looking on while Mr. Goon had stuffed the wet clothes down Fatty's neck. He had been looking for them that morning too, but it was Mr. Goon who had found them and thrown them away on Fatty. How wild the water weed man must have been when he saw something he badly wanted being stuffed down a boy's neck. He must have asked Old Spicer who Fatty was and where he lived, and then he had come to try and get the clothes back that night. Fatty looked at the clothes in the drawer. There's something extraordinarily valuable about you. He said solemnly, "Maybe we'll find out tomorrow." He heard his mother talking to his father. "Are you going to phone the police?" "No, I'm not," said his father's voice. "I don't want that flat-footed policeman stamping all over my house late at night. There's nothing gone, as far as I can see. We'll let Mister Goon sleep in peace." "Thank goodness," said Fatty, sliding into bed. "I just don't feel like seeing Mister Goon again tonight." Chapter Nineteen, Examining the Clothes. To Fatty's relief, his father decided next day not to inform Mister Goon of the attempted robbery at all. Mister Trotville had no great opinion of Mister Goon and was not disposed to waste a morning with him. He'd ask asinine questions and waste everybody's time," said Mister Trotville. "Just have new fastenings put on all the windows, my dear, and another bolt on the front and back door." And perhaps Buster had better sleep downstairs. Buster had other views, however. He had heard suggestions like this before, but however firmly he was put into a basket in the hall and told to be on guard, he was invariably to be found lying on Fatty's bed in the morning. As Mister Trotville said, it was most extraordinary the way that Buster could find his way through a closed bedroom door. Fatty telephoned the others. Come on down as soon as you can. He said, "I've news. We've had robbers in the night. No, nothing taken as far as I can see. Old Buster drove them off. Hurry up and come down." They met down in the shed at the bottom of Fatty's garden. Fatty kept a good lookout for the waterweed man, as he called him, when he took the clothes down to the shed. He wouldn't have been surprised to have him pounce on him from behind a tree. However, Buster trotted happily in front. And nothing untoward happened at all. Fatty was safely ensconced in the shed when the others came tapping at the door. He shut the door and locked it. He pulled the curtains over the windows and lit the little oil lamp so that they were not in complete darkness. Why all the mystery? Asked Daisy, surprised. Going to do conjuring tricks or something? No, but that water weed man is somewhere around. I bet," said Fatty. And I don't want him peeping in at the window while we're examining those clothes. He's dead keen on getting them. He's made two break-ins already in different houses to get them. I don't want to have to give them up at gunpoint. Gracious, Fatty," said Betts in alarm. "It's all right, Betts. And now for the clothes," said Fatty, taking them out of the box he had put them in. "Use your eyes well. There's obviously something we mustn't miss. Now, the trousers first. He shook out the blue trousers. 
They were long ones with little buttons at the top. No pockets, said Fatty. Don't dolls' clothes ever have pockets, Bets? Oh yes, sometimes, said Bets. Aren't they dear little trousers? A boy doll would look nice in those. Let me have them, Fatty. Bets took them. She turned them inside out. There was nothing that would tell them anything. They were just trousers with buttons. Bets passed them round to the others, and then Fatty put them down. Red belt for the trousers, he said, and passed it round. Quite ordinary. A little brass buckle, a bit rusty, due to the river water, I suppose. It was duly examined. Then came the socks. Those were turned inside out too. Bets hunted for any name marked on them, but there wasn't one. Dolls never have their names marked on their clothes, silly," said Pip when Bets remarked why she was looking so carefully. "Mine do," said Bets. "I borrowed Mummy's marking tape and ink, and I've marked all my biggest dolls' clothes with her name, Pamela Mary. Pass the shoes, Fatty. Gosh, aren't they small? Well, they're small for a child, but big for a doll," said Fatty. Very nice shoes, though strong and well made, not like the usual dolls' shoes. These have real laces in too. I suppose these clothes couldn't belong to some child, some tiny little child," said Larry. "Well, I suppose they might," said Fatty. "But for the life of me, I can't see why they're so important. Whether they belong to a doll or a child, not worth breaking into two houses for, anyway." Bets undid the laces and did them up again. They really were nice little shoes. She showed one to Buster. He sniffed at it. Buster, who does it belong to? Said Bets. Go on, tell us. Surely you can tell by the smell. Whose smell is it? Woof, said Buster and pawed at the shoe. Bets dodged it away and Buster sprang at it. He got it in his mouth and ran off with it triumphantly. He stuffed it into a corner and sat down on it as if to say, "It's mine now." Bring it here, Buster," said Bets. "It's ours." Buster took it into his mouth and ran round the shed to hide it somewhere. He was in a silly mood that morning and had already run off with Daisy's handkerchief and Fatty's pencil. "Don't take any notice of him," said Fatty. "He's got one of his show-off fits on. Probably feels very grand because he scared off a burglar last night." "All right, Buster, be an idiot if you want to." "Look, here's the coat, complete with buttons and collar." That was examined too. Fatty ran his hands down the lining. Could there be anything hidden there that might be of value? No, he could feel nothing. Everyone examined it solemnly. It was a well-made little coat of good material, strong and very little worn. The longer we look at these things, the more puzzled I feel," said Fatty. "Who wore them, and why should they have been stolen? At least, I suppose they were stolen. By Mister Fellows, do you mean?" Asked Larry, but how do we know he stole them? Well, why should he have them and hide them as he did? Said Fatty. What beats me is why they are apparently of such importance. Here's the tie, look, and the cap. Nice cap, very nice indeed. Quite a cheeky cap, in fact. He set it on his large head at a comical angle. Bats laughed. <laughs> you look terrible, Fatty. Take it off. Even battier than usual. Said Pip and got a punch from Fatty. Buster, always ready for a battle, flung himself on the two boys, barking. Fatty sat up and pushed him away. "Where's that shoe?" he said severely. "You bring it back here, and we'll admit you into the family circle again. And what have you done with my pencil? If you've chewed the end off, you can count it as your dinner because you won't get any more." Buster retired to his corner, his tongue hanging out. Bats thought he looked sweet. She liked him when he was showing off. Is that all the clothes? Asked Daisy, examining the cap carefully when Fatty handed it round. I simply can't see anything out of the ordinary about these things at all, except that they're better made and stronger than ordinary dolls' clothes. I can't think why they are important. Neither can I, but they must be," said Fatty. He gazed at the pile of clothes rather gloomily. I wouldn't a bit mind Mister Goon having stuffed them down my neck if only they'd proved to be really worthwhile. Help us with this rather peculiar mystery, though I'm beginning to think we may be making a mountain out of a molehill, and that it's not a mystery at all. 
Well, we've only got two or three days more to solve it," said Bets. "I don't think I could bear to go back to school without knowing the solution of this strange little mystery. Do you suppose we ought to take these dolls' clothes back to Mister Fellows?" "Well,、uh, yes, I suppose we should," said Fatty. "I hadn't actually thought of that. We could ask him what his explanation is. We might find out something after all. We'll take them this afternoon. He'll be astonished to see them. I bet." He probably thinks they're still safe in the river. I do wish we'd managed to find some clue hidden in the clothes," said Bats. "I'm sure there must be. Let me go through them just once more, Fatty, before you put them away. You think you might discover something that all five of us couldn't see?" said Pip scornfully. "What a hope! It's always a good thing to have another check on anything if you feel you must," said Fatty, handing the bundle of clothes to Bats. "They're all there, Bats." Except the shoe that Buster took. Hey, Buster, bring back the shoe, old fellow. But before Buster could do as he was told, Bets gave a loud exclamation that made everyone jump. She was examining the little red coat, and she looked up, her eyes shining. Look, we missed this—a little white handkerchief embroidered with daisies, and it's got a name embroidered on it too, very small. Where was it? Asked Fatty, almost snatching the tiny hanky. There's a very small pocket here inside the coat cuff," said Bets, showing the others. "So well hidden that none of us saw it." Fatty, what's the name on the hanky? Fatty spread out the tiny hanky so that all the find outers could see the little daisies on it and the name that was embroidered all round them, making a circle of the letters. Fatty spelt it out. E U R Y C L E S, Euricles. What a name! Never heard it in my life," said Larry. "It's Greek, isn't it?" "Yes, Greek," said Fatty. "Wait, wait. I've heard it before. Who was Euricles?" "I'm remembering. Yes, I'm remembering. Euricles. Of course, I remember now. What a clue!" Chapter Twenty. Mister Euricles, and a talk with Goon. The others stared at Fatty in excitement. What was the clue? Who was Euricles the Greek, and why did it matter who he was? Listen," said Fatty. Euricles was a Greek who lived ages ago, but he happened to be a very well-known Greek because he had a peculiar gift. He was a ventriloquist. He was such a good one that he's never been forgotten, and he had dozens of pupils. I thought ventriloquists were all modern," said Daisy in astonishment. "I mean, I thought it was something that people had thought of in the last century." "Good gracious, no! It's a very old art," said Fatty. "It was well known in Greece, and all kinds of nations have practiced it. The Zulus, for instance, and the Eskimos, and Euricles the Greek was a very fine ventriloquist." I read about him when I was teaching myself to ventriloquize and to throw my voice to a distance. Yes, but why should this doll's hanky have an old Greek ventriloquist's name on it? Said Daisy. And why is it important? I simply don't understand, Fatty. Do explain. Now listen," said Fatty, thrilled. When hankies are embroidered with somebody's name, that name usually belongs to the owner of the hanky, doesn't it? Right. Either the one who owned that hanky and wore these clothes was called Euricles, or his master was, Mister Euricles. What could he be but a ventriloquist? And what could these clothes belong to but his talking doll? The others followed this with interest, and at the end, Pip exclaimed, "Of course, of course, of course! Why didn't we think of it? The clothes were worn by a big doll belonging to a ventriloquist." That's why they are a bit smaller than a child's and rather big for an ordinary doll, and that's why they are very well made. Yes, and I bet he is owned by someone whose stage name is Mister Euricles, after the old Greek ventriloquist," said Fatty jubilantly. "I see daylight at last." Well, it's more than I do," said Larry. "What kind of daylight can you see?" It's true that we think we know who the clothes are worn by, and probably the name of the man who owns the doll who wears the clothes that lived in the house that Jack built," said Daisy with a giggle. "Well," said Fatty, 
We've only got to find Mr. Eurocles and ask him why the clothes are so important, why they were in Mr. Fellows's custody, why they were important enough for someone to try and steal them twice, and why Mr. Fellows fled out in the night to dump them in the river. Once Mr. Eurocles tells us that, the mystery is solved. But how do we find Mr. Eurocles? said Pip after a pause. It might take ages, and we're going back to school so soon. There was a silence which deepened into gloom. Only Fatty remained confident. I'll telephone the place that sells things for conjurers and ventriloquists, he said. They'll soon tell me if there's a Mr. Eurocles. Or Mr. Fellows might tell us, said Daisy suddenly. Yes, he might, said Fatty, and he might not. If he's stolen the clothes himself from Mr. Eurocles, he won't want to say very much. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take the clothes to him this afternoon and see his face when we show them to him, and we'll fire a few questions at him before he's got time to recover from his surprise. Right, said Larry. Well, let's put them away till we're ready to take them. I'm sure I heard your mother in the garden just now, Fatty, and she might want to know why we're all playing with doll's clothes if she walks into the shed. The clothes were bundled anyhow into a box. Fatty shut down the lid. There's the hanky, look, said Betts, holding it out to him. It's such a dear little hanky. I suppose I couldn't keep it in my pocket till we take the clothes to Mr. Fellows, Fatty. I won't blow my nose on it. Yes, you keep it, said Fatty. And congratulations on finding the one thing that led us to the right solution. We're well on the way to solving the whole thing now. Very good, Betts. Betts blushed and put the little hanky into her pocket. It was a bit of luck finding that tiny pocket in the sleeve of the little red coat. I vote we go and have some hot chocolate again at the cafe, said Fatty, and some macaroons if they've made any fresh ones. I feel just like three or four macaroons. Yes, all gooey and crunchy, said Pip. I suddenly feel like a macaroon too. Come on, you do have some bright ideas, Fatty. They went out of the shed with Buster delightedly prancing round their ankles. Fatty locked the door and they all went up the path to the garden gate. They bicycled to the cafe with Buster running beside them. Fatty thought it would be good for him to have a quick run. Take off some of his fat, he said. A fat Scotty is an offence to the eye. Do you hear that, Buster? Woof, woof, panted Buster. Betts giggled. He says that a master is also an offence to the eye, she said. Fatty stared at her in amazement. Bets, you've got very bright and very cheeky all of a sudden. I know, it just popped into my head, said Bets with another giggle. Sorry, Fatty. Look out, you nearly wobbled over Buster. There's Mr. Goon, said Larry suddenly. Look, coming round the corner on his bike. Let's hope he doesn't hang round us. He's probably hoping we won't hang round him, said Fatty, getting off his bicycle and putting it outside the cafe window. Come on in. I smell fresh macaroons. They all trooped in. The little shopwoman beamed at them. They were very good customers indeed. Children always were. They ate twice as much as any grown up who came into her shop. Hot chocolate for everyone, please, and macaroons, said Fatty, sitting down at a table. Five macaroons? asked the shopwoman with a twinkle. Gosh, no! Ten to start with, just so we won't look too greedy, said Fatty with a grin. They're newly made, said the little woman warningly. Don't you eat too many? Are you trying to put us off your magnificent macaroons? said Fatty. What a hope! Ten, please, just to start with. Mr. Goon came in. He was looking worried. You all right? he said to Fatty in an offhand voice. Fatty stared at him, amazed. Why this sudden concern for my health, Mr. Goon? he said. Why shouldn't I be all right? Are you in good health? Let me see your tongue. Say ninety nine, or one hundred and sixty two and a half, if you like. Perhaps he's feeling sorry he behaved so badly yesterday, said Betts unexpectedly, giving Mr. Goon a really fierce glare. Stuffing things down people's necks. Shut up, young Betts, said Fatty. It was a good scrum while it lasted. He looked at Mr. Goon, puzzled. 
It wasn't like the bad-tempered policeman to feel concerned about anything he had done to Fatty. There was something behind this. Fatty wondered what it was. The hot chocolate and macaroons arrived. Fatty threw another glance at Mr. Goon. He was standing looking round the cafe as if he had something to say and didn't know how to begin. What could have happened? Hot cocoa, sir, and a bun or macaroon, said the little shop woman. Just newly made. No, thanks. Uh, well, um, yes, I, I think I will, said Goon, changing his mind suddenly. He sat down at the table next to the children's. He really did look worried. He made the five children feel so uncomfortable that they fell silent. Buster was tied to the leg of the table, but even he didn't seem inclined to bait Mr. Goon that morning. Mr. Goon suddenly cleared his throat with an enormous noise. Now he's going to talk," whispered Pip. "Ah,、uh, you heard from Chief Inspector Jenks lately?" blurted out Goon suddenly. "Not a word," said Fatty promptly. Goon at once looked vastly relieved. He edged his chair a little nearer to the children's table. "See here," he said to Fatty. "I want to talk with you, friendly like." You mean you won't fling yourself at me and stuff things down my neck," said Fatty, attacking a macaroon. "In a word, friendly like." "It's like this," said Goon with his mouth full. "You see, well, it's like this, Frederick. Ah,、uh, well." "Get on, Mister Goon, and say what you want to say," said Fatty, beginning to be impatient. "Good gracious." You sound as if you can't say "ga" to a goose this morning. Betts gave a sudden giggle. "Ga" to a goose. That was just like Fatty. Goon made a great effort and came to the point. "It's like this," he said. "You remember that time we were in Mister Fellows's house together? The time you said you were looking for the kitten?" "Yes," said Fatty. "Well, do you remember hearing a dog growl and a pig grunt and a man groaning?" Said Mister Goon earnestly. The one who longed for his auntie, said Fatty. I've often wondered if she ever went to comfort him. Yes, I remember. Why? What about it? Well,、uh, I made out a report for the chief inspector. See, said Goon. Put it all in, pig and all, and the man who said he never did it and kept on about his auntie. Yes, do get to the point, said Fatty. I can hardly wait. I sent in the report," said Goon miserably, "and the chief don't believe a word of it, not one word. He wasn't half snorty about it over the phone this morning, so I told him you were there too, Frederick, and heard the whole lot. I said you were a proper witness of all the facts, though I hadn't said so in the report." "I see," said Fatty, at once understanding not only Goon's gloom but also his sudden anxiety to be on good terms with him. You want me to back you up, I suppose. Yes. You see,、uh, you did hear all those noises too, didn't you? Said Goon anxiously. I bet you exaggerated everything in your report, said Fatty. I'll back you up in any facts, but not in any exaggerations, Mister Goon. That's flat. Goon drummed his fingers on the table. I may have let myself go a bit, he admitted. I don't rightly remember, but the thing is, you were with me, Frederick, and you did hear things, didn't you? All right, Mister Goon, but I don't see why you had to go and write a fairy tale about the silly happenings in Mister Fellows's house," said Fatty crossly. He was beginning to feel distinctly uncomfortable himself. Suppose the inspector demanded full explanations, Fatty would feel extremely small. He could only hope that nothing more would come of this. Thanks, Frederick," said Goon, breathing more easily. "We've had our scraps, like, and、uh, called each other bad names, but I knew I could depend on you to back up the truth. Thanks." He paid his bill and got up to go. A voice came weakly from the corner of the cafe. "I never did it! I never! I never! I never did it! I..." But Goon was gone, gone like a hare before the hounds. With one horrified glance at the corner, he tore out of the cafe. Was he being haunted? That voice, 
that awful voice. Chapter Twenty One. A dreadful shock. There was a startled silence. The voice had come so suddenly and sounded so pathetic. Then Pip gave Fatty a vigorous punch. Gosh, you startled me! You might warn us when you're going to do that, Mister Eurycles. I swallowed half my macaroon," complained Larry. "You made me jump." "Oh, Fatty, how do you do it?" said Betts. "You sent poor Mister Goon out at sixty miles an hour. I bet he's puzzled. He didn't wait for. I want Auntie." "Serves him right," said Fatty. "What does he want to go and write an idiotic report about pigs and dogs and groaning men for? They weren't important." I bet he spread himself too, put in bits about snarling and the patter of pigs' feet and the sound of a wounded man dragging himself over the floor. I know, Mister Goon. And now I suppose, as he's told the chief you were there, you'll be asked all about it too," said Betts. "Whatever will you say to him? Will you tell him it was all you?" "I don't know," said Fatty gloomily. "Blow, Mister Goon! I bet he was worried in case I said I wouldn't back up his poppycock story, but I'll have to." Any more macaroons, Fatty? Asked Pip. There's one left. No thanks. This has rather spoilt my appetite," said Fatty. Well, you've had four macaroons, if not five, so you can't have much appetite left to spoil," remarked Larry. Finish up the macaroon, Pip. Surprisingly enough, no one wanted it. I'll go a splash and buy it for Buster," said Pip. He's been so good and quiet. Buster was surprised and thrilled. He gulped the macaroon down at once. I call it a waste of a macaroon to gulp it down without a single crunch," said Pip to Buster. "You dogs haven't learnt the art of eating yet. Wasn't he good with Mister Goon this morning, Fatty? Yes, he must have known Mister Goon was in need of comfort and wanted someone to hold his hand and say 'There, there' to him," said Fatty, still cross. Gone all soft-hearted, Buster. Gah. They got up and went off to find their bicycles. Fatty paid the bill. It was a very large one, considering it was only for hot chocolate and macaroons. Still, as Fatty said, school was looming horribly on the horizon, and they might as well make hay and eat macaroons while they could. They biked back to Fatty's, as there was still an hour before lunch. But we must leave in good time today," said Pip. "I really believe Mother will send us to bed on bread and water if we're late again." You're lucky not to have a fierce mother, Fatty. Oh, ours isn't fierce, Pip," said Betts, protesting. "She's just keen on rules being kept. I wouldn't change our mother for anything." "Nor would I," said her brother. "But you can't deny she was pretty fierce yesterday. The thing is, we must leave early." "Let's go down to the shed again," said Larry. "I left a book there. It's a detective story. I thought you mightn't have read, Fatty." Fatty's read every single detective story that's ever been written," said Betts. "He's, why, Fatty, what's up?" Fatty had thrown his bicycle suddenly to the ground when they came to the shed, and had rushed up to the door with a cry. He swung round. "Someone's been here. The lock's forced. The door's ajar. And just look at the inside of the shed." The five stared at the shed. Fatty had swung the door open. And inside were piled all the shed's contents in an incredible muddle. All Fatty's disguises had been torn from their pegs or from their chest and had been flung down. Boxes had been opened and their contents thrown out. It was a scene of utmost confusion and chaos. Oh, Fatty," said Betts, trembling. "Oh, Fatty!" Look at that," said Fatty angrily. "That burglar fellow has been here while we were out." And he's messed up everything, and what's more, I'll bet he's taken those dolls' clothes. Fatty was right; their precious clothes were gone, their biggest, finest clue. The box into which Fatty had thrown them was empty; not even a sock was left. The thief had found at last what he had looked for so persistently. Fatty sat down on a box and groaned. This was a real shock to him. Why did we leave the things here? He almost wailed. Why didn't we take them with us? Now we've finished. Nothing to show for all our work at all.
It must have been the thief we heard in the garden when we thought it was just your mother," said Larry. "Oh, Fatty, isn't this a blow? Well, we can't take the clothes and tackle Mister Fellows now," said Pip. "I don't see that there's anything we can do. Whatever made us leave the things here for the thief to get, and we even go out and leave the coast clear for him? We must have been mad. We were worse. We were fatheads," said Fatty in deep dejection. I blame myself. How could I be such a mutt? It was no good talking about it. The thing was done. The thief had come and gone and had taken what he wanted away with him. Fatty heard a sound near the shed and went out to see if it was the gardener. It was. Mister Hedges, have you seen any stranger about this morning? He asked. Someone's been into my shed. Well, I'll be blowed," said Hedges. That'd be that fellow with the scarred cheek, I expect. A nasty chap he looked. I turned him away once. He was trying to make me give him an order for manure. I found him in the garden. He said he was looking for me, Frederick, but I guess he was looking about for what he could steal. Fatty nodded and went back to the others. He was very down in the dumps. It was the waterweed man, all right, he said. The gardener said he had a scarred cheek, so that proves it was the fellow we know. Blow, blow, blow! I'll never forgive myself for this. Let's tidy up," said Betts. "We can't leave you to put everything back in its place by yourself. Come on, Daisy. I'll hand you Fatty's disguises to hang up." Everyone was soon busy putting the shed tidy again. It took quite a long time. As Betts was picking up a few things, she gave a sudden exclamation. "I've just remembered." The tiny hanky with daisies on it and the name Eurycles is in my pocket," she said. "The thief wouldn't have found it with the other clothes." Everyone stared at it. "Well," said Fatty, fingering it, "you'd better keep it for yourself, Betts. It's not much good to us now." She put the tiny hanky back into her pocket. She felt rather bad. It was all that was left of their wonderful collection of clues. She went on tidying up everything with the others. Better shove all the rest of the things into that chest," said Fatty at last, looking at his watch. "You ought to go. It's getting near dinner time." So the last few armfuls were flung higgledy piggledy into the chest, and the lid was shut down. Then the four got their bicycles, shouted goodbye to Fatty, and raced off. Fatty went slowly back to the house. He was very depressed. Things had been going so well. Now all they had left of their biggest clue was the tiny hanky with Eurycles embroidered on it, and a fat lot of good that was. Fatty reflected. Was there much point in trying to find out if there was a ventriloquist called Mister Eurycles? Fatty thought not. He was beginning to feel fed up with the whole thing. Oh, there you are, Frederick," said his mother as he came slowly in. "Dear me, you do look miserable. Cheer up." A great friend of yours telephoned this morning, but you were out, so he's telephoning this afternoon. Who's that? Asked Fatty, not at all interested. It was probably one of his school friends. He thought, how boring! He would see enough of them in a few days. Poor Fatty was indeed feeling depressed. It was Chief Inspector Jenks," said his mother, expecting Fatty to be delighted. He thought the world of the chief. Who knew all the children very well and had often welcomed their help in many curious mysteries. But far from pleasing him, the news made Fatty feel more down in the dumps than ever. Now he'd have a very difficult and awkward telephone conversation with the chief. Chief Inspector Jenks had a high opinion of Fatty's capabilities, but a low opinion of some of his jokes. Fatty felt that things were getting worse than ever. He ate a very poor lunch. Though whether it was because he was worried or had had too many macaroons, he didn't know. Probably both, he thought. The telephone rang immediately after the meal ended. "That's the chief inspector, Frederick," said his mother. "You answer it, will you?" Fatty went. He picked up the receiver. "Hello," he said. "This is..." "Ah, Frederick," interrupted a voice. "It's you. Good. I wanted to speak to you." "Delighted, sir." Said Fatty, most untruthfully. Listen, I've had a most extraordinary report in from Goon," said the chief. "He sent in plenty of peculiar reports in his time, 
but this beats them all. It's so extraordinary that I didn't believe it. But when I telephoned him, he not only swore it was true, but said that you would back him up. He said you were a witness to all the things in his report. Though why he didn't mention you were there when he wrote his report, I don't know. Quite, sir, said Fatty politely. Apparently, Goon went to inspect a house that was empty and that had been reported as burgled, said the chief, sounding very businesslike and brisk. He says that there was a kitten there mewing, a dog which growled most ferociously and snarled and was ready, so he infers, to eat him up, and a pig, a pig, p i g, that grunted somewhere and stamped about overhead. Really, Frederick, I am ashamed to quote from this report. Fatty couldn't help grinning into the telephone. Goon had certainly let himself go. Go on, sir, he said. And to crown everything, Goon reports that there was a wounded man in the house who was groaning and dragging himself about somewhere, crying out, "I never did it! I never! Ooh, I never did it! Where's my auntie?" It sounds quite incredible, Frederick. It does, sir," said Fatty, trying to keep his end of the phone very businesslike and not give away anything. There was a pause. Are you still there, Frederick? Well. I may as well say that as soon as Goon told me you were in the house with him, I smelt a rat—not a dog or a pig or any other animal, Frederick, but a rat. Do you understand me? Uh, yes, I think I do, sir," said Fatty. There was another pause. Then the chief's voice came again, a harder note in it. I imagine I am correct in thinking that you had something to do with the extraordinary things in this report," he rapped out. Well,、uh, yes, sir," said Fatty, wishing this one-sided conversation would end. He didn't like the sound of the chief's stern voice at all. Exactly what did you have to do with it? Please be a little more explicit, Frederick. I'm getting tired of this yes, sir, no, sir business. You usually have plenty to say for yourself. Yes, sir. Well,、uh, it's like this," said Fatty desperately. "I've been practicing ventriloquism and." Practicing what? Ventriloquism! Shouted Fatty. Oh, ventriloquism! Good heavens! I didn't think of that. Bless us all! Ventriloquism! What next? What an absolute menace you are, Frederick! There's no other word for it—a menace. Yes, sir," said Fatty, sensing that the chief was not feeling quite so angry. I say, sir, there's a bit of a mystery on here, and I want to get hold of a ventriloquist myself. A man called Mr. Eurycles. How can I find out about him? There was a startled pause. Did you say Eurycles? Came the chief's voice in amazement. Now why do you want to see him? Wait. Don't say a word more over the telephone. Not a word. I'm coming straight over. Keep your mouth shut till I come. Chapter Twenty Two. An exciting meeting. There was a click as the chief put down his receiver. Fatty put back his too, feeling rather dazed. What an abrupt ending! Why was the chief so astonished? Did he know about their little mystery then? Did he actually know anything about Mister Eurycles? It was all very puzzling. Fatty rubbed his nose. He wasn't altogether pleased at the idea of seeing Chief Inspector Jenks that afternoon. He didn't particularly want the subject of dogs and pigs and groaning men reopened, and it might quite well be. Mrs. Trotville was curious to know what the conversation had been about. She had heard the word ventriloquism because Fatty had shouted it so loudly. "What's this about ventriloquism, Frederick?" she asked. "Did I hear you say you were practicing it? I do wish you wouldn't. I suppose that explains all those peculiar noises that keep coming from your room when you are up there alone." Yes, Mummy, but don't you get all hot and bothered about it," said Fatty. "I'll be back at school in a very short time. Then the house will be nice and quiet. By the way,、uh, the chief inspector is coming over here this afternoon. Do you mind if I get the other four along? They'll like to see him, especially Bets. Yes, get them along if you like," said his mother. "But Frederick, I hope all this doesn't mean you've been mixing yourselves up again in matters that don't concern you." I really did hope you'd not lead the others into trouble these holidays. Fatty was indignant. I never lead them into trouble, Mummy. How can you say such a thing? 
Why, even the inspector has often told me that— All right, Frederick, said his mother. I am not going to argue with you. Telephone the others and see if they can come to tea. There is a nice new batch of cakes in today, and I brought in some macaroons from the cafe. You haven't had any for a long time. Not so very long, thought Fatty, pleased at the idea of a few more that afternoon. He went to telephone the others, but, remembering the chief's injunction to keep his mouth shut, he gave them no hint as to the unexpected visit, though he would dearly have liked Bets to know. She was very fond of the high-up policeman, as she used to call him. It's a pity we've got to tell the chief that we were idiotic enough to leave the doll's clothes unguarded so that they were stolen, thought Fatty. That won't be a very good mark for me. I can't think how I was such a fathead. Well, the deed is done. The chief arrived first, in his big black shiny car, driven by a police driver, and surprisingly, with him came a distinguished-looking man in plain clothes. Fatty was at the door when the car came up the drive and stopped outside. He welcomed the chief with pleasure. The big, burly, good-looking man grinned at Fatty. Well, you menace, I have a good mind to cast you off and have no more to do with you. He turned to the tall, quiet man by his side. Sir, this is the boy I was telling you about. He plagues the local police, but at times he's been very useful to me. He's dependable and responsible, so you can tell him what you like. Let me introduce Frederick Trotville. Fatty shook hands solemnly. He noticed that the chief didn't tell him the tall man's name. It was obvious that he was a very big noise, Fatty thought, probably in the Secret Service or Scotland Yard. Anyway, a bit hush-hush. Fatty looked at him in awe. They all went into the sitting-room, where a bright fire was burning. Mrs. Trotville had gone out to one of her bridge afternoons. Fatty was thankful. He didn't particularly want his mother to be present if his escapades with Goon were to be gone into. They sat down. Now, first of all, Frederick, what do you know about Mr. Eurycles? asked the chief, coming straight to the point as usual. Not much, confessed Fatty. I'd better tell you everything from the beginning, sir. Then you'll see how we finally arrived at Mr. Eurycles. It's a funny little story. We got mixed up in it somehow, but it's rather interesting. Far away, said the chief. We're listening. I may take a few notes as you relate your tale, but don't let that worry you. Now then. Fatty was just beginning his tale when he heard the loud ringing of four bicycle bells, and Buster began to bark and paw at the door. Oh, uh, it's the others, sir, said Fatty apologetically. Do you mind if they come in too? I mean, they were all in it. Fetch them in, said the chief, and Fatty went to the window, threw it up, and yelled, Hey, all of you, come in here, quick! The four parked their bicycles in a hurry and rushed in at the garden door. What was up? They burst into the sitting room and stopped in amazement when they saw their old friend, Chief Inspector Jenks, tall and burly as ever, a wide smile on his good-humoured face. Bets flung herself on him, and as usual he swung her high in the air and she shrieked. The others crowded round eagerly. What fun to see the Chief again, and how exciting! What did it mean? The tall, quiet man also stood up, smiling. He seemed very much amused with all this. The chief introduced the four newcomers to him one by one. But again he did not say who the stranger was. The tall man was very courteous, and his shrewd, dark eyes rested in turn on each child's face. Fatty guessed that he didn't miss much. "'What have you come for? Not just to see us!' cried Betts. "'I came because I think you may have a tale to tell me that will help me in something else.' said the chief. Frederick was just about to tell it when you arrived. Sit down, and we'll hear it. Everyone sat down, Bets as near the big chief as she could possibly get. Fatty began again. He described the breaking into Mr. Fellows's house, and what the milkman had reported. He told how he and the others had gone to have a look at the house which was so near Larry's. And I suppose you managed to find an excuse for a little breaking in yourself, Frederick said the chief. Well, there was a kitten left behind, said Fatty, grinning, and while I was looking for it in the house, Mr. Goon appeared. I see. And then the dog and the pig and the groaning man began to haunt the house too, I suppose. 
said the chief. All right, we won't go into details. I've had too many already from Goon. I know all this bit, actually. It was fully reported to me at once. Tell me the bits I'm not likely to know. So Fatty told him of the question he had put to himself. Who could have seen Mr. Fellows rushing out at night? He went on to describe his talks with the night watchman, and regretfully he decided that he must also tell of his impersonation of the old man with the sack, and describe how he had led Mr. Goon to the jetty and tipped in the sack of stones. Most reprehensible, murmured the chief. Yes, sir, agreed Fatty, hurrying on. He told how the five of them had gone down to see if Mr. Goon would drag out the sack the next day, and what he would do when he found he had been spoofed. He described the watching waterweed man, which caused both the chief and his plainclothes friend to sit up straight and look at one another. Give me a full description of this man, please, said the chief, and helped by the others, Fatty gave a very full description indeed. Excellent, said the chief. Most observant lot you are. I wouldn't be surprised if you told me everything the fellow had in his pockets. <laughs> Wait a minute now. You say Goon arrived just then? Yes, sir. Said Fatty. The chief took a sheaf of papers from his pockets and chose one, which he read quickly to himself. This is Goon's report of that morning, he said, but it's confused and lacks detail. I think we'd better get him along here too, now that he comes well into the tale. I may want to ask him a few questions. Shall I telephone him, sir? said Larry at once. What a wonderful meeting! Goon would just about complete it. Poor Goon! He didn't shine on these occasions. The chief nodded and began to make some notes, which he passed to the stranger. Larry telephoned, got Mr. Goon at once, and gave him the chief's message. What did he say? inquired the chief when Larry returned. Well, er,、uh, not much, sir, said Larry, embarrassed. Actually, he just said, love a duck, nothing else. Everyone laughed. Betts began to play with Buster. But it wasn't more than two minutes before Goon came sailing up the drive on his bicycle. He was met at the door by Fatty, who ushered him solemnly into the rather crowded sitting room. Goon was very nervous. He hadn't taken off his bicycle clips, nor had he stopped to brush his uniform, which showed traces of his dinner. He slipped his helmet off and put it on the floor. Sit down, Goon, said the chief. I'm glad you came so quickly. Ah.、Uh, We have been hearing quite an interesting little tale from Frederick here, and we thought you should hear it too, though no doubt you already know a good deal. Goon looked hurriedly and beseechingly at Fatty. He sat down heavily, and Buster at once capered round his ankles. Fatty called him off sternly. Be quiet, Buster. This is a serious meeting. He turned to the chief again. Shall I go on, sir? Well, that morning. Mr. Goon did come down to the river as we expected, and he took a boat and rowed to the jetty where I'd thrown in the sack of stones the night before. A snort came from Goon, but nobody took any notice of it. Mr. Goon found a sack, sir, but it wasn't the sack I'd thrown in. It was another one. Goon stared at Fatty, his mouth open. What? That boy hadn't put in that sack. Then who had? Mr. Goon opened the sack, sir, and it was full of very peculiar things: clothes, sir, doll's clothes, coat, trousers, belt, tie, socks, and a glove to match the one I told you I'd found in Mr. Fellows's house. That made us guess the sack was the one that Mr. Fellows himself had hidden in the river. So we took all the clothes home. But wait a minute, how did you get them? I thought Goon had them in the sack he pulled up," said the chief, puzzled. Well," said Fatty, looking embarrassed. "He, uh, well, uh, he gave them to me, sir. Gave me every single one. You look surprised. Well,、uh, so was I." Chapter Twenty Three: A Strange Tale. But I don't understand," said the chief. "These clothes were a most important clue." Goon, what in the world made you hand them over to Frederick? Mister Goon swallowed hard; his face was going a peculiar colour. That boy, that toad of a boy, 
Here he was in trouble again because of that boy. He couldn't think for the life of him what to answer. But Bets answered for him. He didn't give them to him, she said indignantly. He stuffed everything down Fatty's neck, all wet and slimy too. Be quiet, Bets, said Fatty uncomfortably. I'd asked for it. What peculiar behaviour, goon, said the chief, astounded. No wonder your report was hard to follow. Is it a habit of yours to stuff things down people's necks when you are annoyed? No, sir, muttered Goon, his eyes on the floor. How was I to know those clothes were important, sir? I wouldn't have stuffed them down his neck if I thought they'd got anything to do with this case. I was... Well, I was downright annoyed that morning, sir. I didn't mind, said Fatty earnestly, sorry for poor Goon at that moment. As a matter of fact, I rather enjoyed it. It was very clever of Mr. Goon to stuff every single thing down my neck, shoes and all. Shoes? Did you say shoes? said the chief at once. He made a quick note. Well, we will now leave this subject of stuffing clothes down necks, as I see it is rather painful to Goon, and get on with the next part of the tale. Fatty told how they had dried out the clothes, how there had been a breaking into his own house that night, but nothing was taken, how he had interviewed Mr. Fellows and got nothing but evasions, and finally, how they had examined the clothes that very morning, and how Betts had made her interesting discovery. Goon was now listening intently. This was all new to him. We found nothing of interest at all, sir, said Fatty, until Betts here found a tiny pocket hidden in the sleeve cuff, and in it was a handkerchief embroidered with daisies, and the name I told you, Eurycles. Betts, where's the hanky? Betts produced it proudly. In an intent silence, the chief and his friend examined it. Mr. Goon gaped. What was all this? What did a doll's handkerchief matter? What did you deduce from this handkerchief, then? asked the chief. Well, first I recognized the name Eurycles, said Fatty. The stranger spoke directly to Fatty for the first time. Why did you recognize it? It is not a usual name, he said. No, I, I know that, sir, said Fatty. In fact, I'd never met anyone of that name in my life, though for all I know there may be plenty of Greeks called Eurycles. I recognized it because, well, because I'm a bit of a ventriloquist, as I told the chief here. You see, there was once a Greek called Eurycles who was a very famous ventriloquist indeed. I read about him in my book on ventriloquism. Remarkable, said the stranger in his soft voice. And so you thought that the clothes must belong to a doll owned by a modern ventriloquist called Mr. Eurycles? Yes, that's right, said Fatty. I was at a dead end as regards this mystery, and I thought perhaps if I could find out if there really was a ventriloquist using the old Greek name as a stage name, I could ask him a few questions. I thought he might be able to solve this peculiar mystery for us. That's why I asked the chief on the telephone if he knew of anyone called Eurycles and how I could get in touch with him. I see. Again, I say, it's most remarkable, said the tall man. Well, you'll be interested to know that there is a modern ventriloquist who uses Eurycles as his stage name, and that those clothes you speak of do belong to his doll, and you'll be interested to know that we have been searching everywhere for the clothes. Why? asked Fatty, astonished. Gosh, what a lot of people are interested in those clothes! I propose to tell you a little story myself now, said the chief's friend, a story which you must keep to yourselves. You are not to ask me any questions about it. You must accept my tale as it stands. I will tell you why my friend, the chief inspector here, was amazed when you spoke of Mr. Eurycles to him. This was all very astonishing. Every eye was on the quiet stranger as he began his tale. You know the chief inspector, and you know that I am a friend of his, in the same kind of service. We work to preserve the law and order of our country, to keep out enemies, to secure for this country the things that are right and proper. He paused. Everyone felt very solemn, and Betts found that she was holding her breath. Very well. It is our duty to discover and watch any man or woman who is working against this country and its laws. There are many of them 
some in high up places, some in lowly ones. Our duty is to watch, to sift out what we hear, and to report whenever we find anyone suspected of misdeeds against the country and its laws. Spies! whispered Bats. Not only spies, but any man or woman of evil intent, said the tall man. Mr. Eurycles was one who helped us in this. He was a clever ventriloquist who went everywhere with Bobby Boy, his talking doll. He went to both high and low places and gathered a great deal of information for us. Mr. Fellows was his assistant. Oh! cried Daisy. Was he really? So that's how he comes in! One day, one of Mr. Eurycles's friends came to him with a list of names, went on the chief's friend. They were names that we wanted more than anything else. Names of people undermining every industry in our country, provoking strikes, sabotage, anything that would harm Britain. And there was also other information, very valuable indeed to us. Mr. Eurycles put the information into his usual hiding place, in the clothes that Bobby Boy wore. Everyone listened intently, especially Mr. Goon. That night, Mr. Eurycles was kidnapped. The kidnappers took Bobby Boy also, knowing that either on Mr. Eurycles or on his doll, the list of names was hidden. But the ventriloquist managed to throw the doll out of the window of the car that kidnapped him. Following the car was one of our police cars, as it happened, not because the police suspected that Mr. Eurycles was in the first car, but because they knew it to be a stolen car. When the doll was thrown out, the police in the car behind thought it was a small child, and stopped their car, of course, to see. They lost the first car, and returned to headquarters. Mr. Fellows had by then reported the kidnapping of his master, the ventriloquist, so the doll, Bobby Boy, was handed to him. Apparently he knew that Mr. Eurycles had hidden something of value in the clothes, but he had no idea what. So he took the clothes into his keeping, hoping that his master would soon turn up. Oh, I see. And then the kidnappers found out that the list wasn't on Mr. Eurycles, but somewhere in the doll's clothes, and have been hunting for it ever since, cried Daisy. And that's why Mr. Fellows ran out with the clothes in the middle of the night when someone broke into his house, and he sank them into the river, meaning to get them again sometime, said Pip, seeing everything now. And then the waterweed man, who was the burglar, saw Mr. Goon stuffing them down Fatty's neck, and so the next place he broke into was Fatty's. Goodness, we were in the middle of something terribly exciting, and we didn't know it. Why didn't Mr. Fellows look for the valuable list himself and take it? asked Betts. Then he could have thrown the clothes away. I imagine that he wasn't able to find it, and anyway, he didn't know what to look for, said the chief. But we shall be able to find it. We have had information as to where it is. If you'll just produce the clothes, Frederick, we will show you where the invaluable list is hidden, a most dramatic ending to what you called just a little mystery. There was a dead silence. All the excitement drained out of the children as they remembered the disastrous happening of the morning. What's the matter? said the chief, surprised. You have got the clothes here, haven't you? What are you looking like that for? It's awful to have to tell you, sir, but they're gone, said Fatty in a low voice. We... we went out of the shed where we kept them, locked it behind us, and when we got back the shed was broken open, and all the clothes were gone. Bats burst into tears. What shall we do? Oh, we didn't know it was so important. Oh, Fatty, what shall we do? Chapter 24 Good Old Buster The chief inspector whistled through his teeth and looked at his plainclothes friend. This is a setback, he said. A real shock. Our scarred-faced friend again, I suppose. He's certainly determined this time. That list is important to him, and to a lot of others who would like it destroyed, said the tall man grimly. And unfortunately, it is important to us, too. He turned to Fatty. All the clothes went. He took the lot, he asked sharply. Yes, all except for the little hanky Bets found, which you've seen, said Fatty. But if you like, we can go down to my shed and have another look in the box where we put them. 
but I'm pretty certain it's empty, sir. They trailed down to the shed, Mr. Goon too, all of them feeling most depressed. To have such an exciting mystery, and then to have the right ending snatched away just as they were being so successful, it really was bad luck. They looked into the box. It was, as Fatty said, well and truly empty. Then Betts suddenly remembered something and cried out loudly. The shoe that Buster took! Did we find it and hide that away too? Or did we forget it and leave it in whatever corner Buster put it? We forgot it. I didn't put it in, said Fatty. But would just one shoe be of any use to you, sir? My word, yes. More than you'd think if it was the right shoe, said the chief. Here, Buster boy, find that shoe. And as if Buster completely understood, he ran round the shed, hunting into this corner and that. And finally, after sniffing under an old sack, he disappeared beneath it, worried at something, and came out proudly with a doll's red shoe in his mouth. It's the shoe! He's found it! said Fatty in delight. Good old Buster! Clever dog, Buster! Buster wagged his tail proudly. The chief took the shoe at once, and he and his friend examined it closely. It may be the one. Can't tell without examining it, said the chief. Anyone got a sharp penknife? Fatty had, of course. He always kept his pockets full of things that might conceivably come in useful some day. The chief took the knife and sat down on a box. He turned the shoe upside down, and with all the find outers breathing heavily down his neck, he began to try and prise away the heel. Strongly made, said the chief. Ah,、uh, up it comes. The heel came away from the shoe. And the children saw a neat little hollowed out compartment in the heel itself. In it was a thin sheet of paper tightly folded. It's here! cried the chief, as excited as the five children. His fingers delicately eased the paper from its hiding place. He handed it, folded, to the tall man, whose eyes were now gleaming. He unfolded the paper very carefully and ran his eyes down a list of names and notes. They were all written in a most minute writing, impossible to make out at a distance. Mr. Goon, craning his neck to see if he could read anything, could only make out a blur. This is it, said the tall man, a ring of triumph in his voice. There's a whole year's work here, invaluable, Jenks, and to think how nearly we lost it. If it hadn't been for that dog running off with the shoe as he did and hiding it, we'd have lost it for good. The thief must have just seen the bundle of clothes in the box, thought everything was there, and picked the whole lot up, said Fatty, and gone off with it in delight. What a shock when he finds only one shoe! Perhaps he'll come back and try and find it, suggested Larry. You could catch him then. Oh, we know where to pick him up now, said the chief. My word, look at this name on the list, and that. Phew, this is going to make a stir. It is. It's going to make several dozen people extremely uncomfortable," said the tall man grimly. "What a haul! I can't believe it, and all because of these kids. Marvelous, aren't they? Well, they've certainly done some good work in their time," said the chief, smiling. "Very good work. They call themselves the Five Find Outers and Dog, you know, and the things they've found out. They could really have books and books written about them." But Buster's really the hero of this mystery," said Betts, picking up the little Scotty and hugging him. "Aren't you, Buster? Did you know that shoe was important, Buster? Is that why you hid it, Fatty? I'd be quite ready to believe that Buster did guess. You know. What are you going to do now?" asked Larry, turning to the chief. "Well, just a few bits of work," said the chief. "We must go and drop in on Fellows to begin with and set his mind at rest." And we must send somebody to gather in Mister Scardface, or the Waterweed Man, as you call him. He won't be wanting waterweed for some time after this. I do hope you'll get Mister Euricles back some day," said Betts. "I hope nothing horrid's happened to him." I'll let you know when he does appear again," said the chief. "I have a feeling that once we get after the people whose names are on this sheet of paper, our Mister Euricles will find himself unexpectedly free." Quite a lot of these people will flee the country soon. Ah,、uh, can't we give these children a little reward for their enormous help? 
said the tall man, getting up from his box and almost bumping his head against the roof. Oh, no, thank you, said Fatty at once. That would spoil everything. We wouldn't want to solve mysteries for a reward. We do it because it's fun, and we like helping the chief. My dear fellow, there are so few people left in the world who will do things without expecting payment or reward that I think we'll let the find outers go their own good way, said the chief to his friend quite seriously. That made the five feel extremely proud. Right, said the tall man. Well, we must be going. Still, there are two things I'm going to do for these, uh, what do they call themselves? These find outers and dog. <laughs> I am going to get my butcher to send his biggest and juiciest bone to this remarkably clever dog. Woof! said Buster, wagging his tail most appreciatively. And when Mr. Eurycles turns up again, I shall ask him if he would be good enough to give Frederick here a few first class lessons in ventriloquism, said the tall man. He'll be delighted to do that. Fatty blushed with pleasure. Oh, sir, thank you! I don't want any reward, as you know, and I'll pay for the lessons. Gosh, wouldn't I like them? Thanks very much. The chief and his friend departed. The police car revved up and disappeared down the drive. Only Mr. Goon was left with the five children. They looked at one another. Poor old Goon. He hadn't had much of a look in this time. The chief hadn't even said a word of farewell to him. Even Buster had done better than Goon. Well, said Fatty in a jovial tone, what about tea? It must surely be ready by now. Anyway, I'm ready for it. Mr. Goon, will you join us? Mr. Goon was so astounded at this invitation that he could only gape. He was not a generous enemy like Fatty and never would be. He hardly understood this invitation and his mouth opened and shut like a goldfish. Well, do answer, Mr. Goon, said Fatty. We'll celebrate the occasion, and I'll open the big tin of chocolate biscuits I got for Christmas. Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, Mr. Goon? I will, gasped Goon, almost as if he was getting married. Thanks, sir. I'll take it very kind of you after, uh, after some of the things that have happened. Well, don't you go stuffing things down my neck again, said Fatty, leading the way in. Goon gave a sudden grin. And don't you go making up dogs and pigs and what not, he said. Betts didn't want Goon to stay to tea, but she said nothing. She liked Fatty's generous gesture, and she knew that poor Mr. Goon hadn't had a very good time in this mystery. But nothing was going to persuade her to sit next to him, or even to address a word to him. She would never, ever forgive him for stuffing those things down Fatty's neck. It was a most hilarious tea. Everyone was pleased that the little mystery had turned out to be a genuine large size one and had ended so triumphantly for Buster. Buster, of course, was amazed to find his old enemy suddenly belonging to the family circle. He gave a few fierce growls, and then, as everyone made so much fuss of him and Daisy actually addressed him as Hero Dog, he joined in the general enjoyment. Mr. Goon enjoyed himself too. Well, well. To think that toad of a boy could behave like this. After his fourth macaroon and third piece of chocolate cake, Mr. Goon was ready to be Fatty's best friend. And then a loud grunting noise was heard under the table. What's that? cried Betts in alarm. Mr. Goon looked under the table amazed. Only Buster was there. The others looked at Fatty's grinning face and laughed. And then... From just behind the astounded Mr. Goon came an all too familiar voice. I never did it! I never! Oh! I never did it! Where's my auntie? Oh, Fatty, what are we to do with you? Tell us about your next mystery, do! <laughs>
He hadn't had much of a look in this time. The chief hadn't even said a word of farewell to him. Even Buster had done better than Goon. Well, said Fatty in a jovial tone, what about tea? It must surely be ready by now. Anyway, I'm ready for it. Mr. Goon, will you join us? Mr. Goon was so astounded at this invitation that he could only gape. He was not a generous enemy like Fatty, and never would be. He hardly understood this invitation, and his mouth opened and shut like a goldfish. Well, do answer, Mr. Goon, said Fatty. We'll celebrate the occasion, and I'll open the big tin of chocolate biscuits I got for Christmas. Will you, won't you, will you, won't you, Mr. Goon? I will, gasped Goon, almost as if he was getting married. Thanks, sir. I'll take it very kind of you after, uh, after some of the things that have happened. Well, don't you go stuffing things down my neck again, said Fatty, leading the way in. Goon gave a sudden grin. And don't you go making up dogs and pigs and what not, he said. Betts didn't want Goon to stay to tea, but she said nothing. She liked Fatty's generous gesture, and she knew that poor Mr. Goon hadn't had a very good time in this mystery. But nothing was going to persuade her to sit next to him, or even to address a word to him. She would never, ever forgive him for stuffing those things down Fatty's neck. It was a most hilarious tea. Everyone was pleased that the little mystery had turned out to be a genuine large size one and had ended so triumphantly for Buster. Buster, of course, was amazed to find his old enemy suddenly belonging to the family circle. He gave a few fierce growls, and then, as everyone made so much fuss of him and Daisy actually addressed him as Hero Dog, he joined in the general enjoyment. Mr. Goon enjoyed himself too. Well, well, to think that toad of a boy could behave like this. After his fourth macaroon and third piece of chocolate cake, Mr. Goon was ready to be Fatty's best friend. And then a loud grunting noise was heard under the table. What's that? cried Betts in alarm. Mr. Goon looked under the table amazed. Only Buster was there. The others looked at Fatty's grinning face and laughed. And then... From just behind the astounded Mr. Goon came an all too familiar voice. I never did it! I never! Oh! I never did it! Where's my auntie? Oh, Fatty, what are we to do with you? Tell us about your next mystery, do. <laughs>